Question 83, Part 1 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 83 of the right of this sacrament in six articles part one articles one through three we have now to consider the right of this sacrament under which head there are six points of inquiry first whether christ is sacrificed in the celebration of this mystery second of the time of celebrating third of the place and other matters related to the equipment for this celebration fourth of the words uttered in celebrating this mystery fifth of the actions performed in celebrating this mystery sixth of the defects which occur in the celebration of this sacrament first article whether christ is sacrificed in this sacrament Objection 1. It seems that Christ is not sacrificed in the celebration of the sacrament, for it is written in Hebrews 10.14 that Christ by one oblation hath perfected for ever them that are sanctified. But that oblation was his oblation. Therefore Christ is not sacrificed in the celebration of this sacrament. Objection 2. Further christ's sacrifice was made upon the cross whereon he delivered himself for us an oblation and a sacrifice to god for an odor of sweetness as is said in ephesians five two but christ is not crucified in the celebration of this mystery therefore neither is he sacrificed objection three further as augustine says in on the trinity four in christ's sacrifice the priest and the victim are one and the same but in the celebration of this sacrament the priest and the victim are not the same therefore the celebration of this sacrament is not a sacrifice of christ on the contrary augustine says in his book on the sentences of prosper christ was sacrificed once in himself and yet he is sacrificed daily in the sacrament. I answer that, the celebration of this sacrament is called a sacrifice for two reasons. First, because, as Augustine says, the images of things are called by the names of the things whereof they are the images, as when we look upon a picture or a fresco we say, this is Cicero, and that is Sallust. But as was said above in question 79, article 1, the celebration of this sacrament is an image representing Christ's passion, which is his true sacrifice. Accordingly, the celebration of this sacrament is called Christ's sacrifice. Hence it is that Ambrose, in commenting on Hebrews 10, 1, says, In Christ was offered up a sacrifice capable of giving eternal salvation. What then do we do? do we not offer it up every day in memory of his death secondly it is called a sacrifice in respect of the effect of his passion because to wit by this sacrament we are made partakers of the fruit of our lord's passion hence in one of the sunday secrets the ninth sunday after pentecost we say whenever the commemoration of this sacrifice is celebrated the work of our redemption is enacted Consequently, according to the first reason, it is true to say that Christ was sacrificed, even in the figures of the Old Testament. Hence it is stated in the Apocalypse, chapter 13, verse 8, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, which was slain from the beginning of the world. But according to the second reason, it is proper to the sacrament for Christ to be sacrificed in its celebration. Reply to Objection 1. As Ambrose says, in commenting on Hebrews 10.1, there is but one victim, namely, that which Christ offered and which we offer, and not many victims, because Christ was offered but once, 
and this latter sacrifice is the pattern of the former. For just as what is offered everywhere is one body, and not many bodies, so also is it but one sacrifice. Reply to Objection 2. As the celebration of this sacrament is an image representing Christ's passion, so the altar is representative of the cross itself, upon which Christ was sacrificed in his proper species. Reply to Objection 3. For the same reason, the priest also bears Christ's image, in whose person and by whose power he pronounces the words of consecration, as is evident from what has been said above in question 82, articles 1 and 3. And so, in a measure, the priest and victim are one and the same. Second article. Whether the time for celebrating this mystery has been properly determined. Objection 1. It seems that the time for celebrating this mystery has not been properly determined, for as was observed above in Article 1, this sacrament is representative of our Lord's Passion. But the commemoration of our Lord's Passion takes place in the Church once in the year, because Augustine says, Is not Christ slain as often as the Pasch is celebrated? Nevertheless, the anniversary remembrance represents what took place in bygone days, and so does it not cause us to be stirred as if we saw our Lord hanging upon the cross? Therefore, this sacrament ought to be celebrated but once a year. Objection to further. Christ's Passion is commemorated in the Church on the Friday before Easter, and not on Christmas Day. Consequently, since this sacrament is commemorative of our Lord's Passion, it seems unsuitable for this sacrament to be celebrated thrice on Christmas Day, and to be entirely omitted on Good Friday. Objection 3 further. In the celebration of this sacrament, the Church ought to imitate Christ's institution. But it was in the evening that Christ consecrated this sacrament. Therefore, it seems that this sacrament ought to be celebrated at that time of the day. Objection for, further, as is set down in the Decretals, Pope Leo I wrote to Dioscorus, Bishop of Alexandria, that it is permissible to celebrate Mass in the first part of the day. But the day begins at midnight, as was said above in question 80, article 8, fifth reply. Therefore, it seems that after midnight it is lawful to celebrate. Objection 5 further. If one of the Sunday secrets, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, we say, Grant us, Lord, we beseech thee, to frequent these mysteries. But there will be greater frequency if the priest celebrates several times a day. Therefore it seems that the priest ought not to be hindered from celebrating several times daily. On the contrary is the custom which the Church observes according to the statutes of the canons. I answer that, as stated above in Article 1, in the celebration of this mystery, we must take into consideration the representation of our Lord's Passion and the participation of its fruits, and the time suitable for the celebration of this mystery ought to be determined by each of these considerations. Now since, owing to our daily defects, we stand in daily need of the fruits of our Lord's Passion, this sacrament is offered regularly, every day in the Church. Hence our Lord teaches us to pray, in Luke 11.3, Give us this day our daily bread. In explanation of which words, Augustine says, If it be a daily bread, why do you take it once a year, as the Greeks have the custom in the East? Receive it daily, that it may benefit you every day. But since our Lord's Passion was celebrated from the third to the ninth hour, therefore this sacrament is solemnly celebrated by the Church in that part of the day. Reply to Objection 1. Christ's Passion is recalled in this sacrament 
inasmuch as its effect flows out to the faithful but at passion tide christ's passion is recalled inasmuch as it was wrought in him who is our head this took place but once whereas the faithful receive daily the fruits of his passion consequently the former is commemorated but once in the year whereas the latter takes place every day both that we may partake of its fruit and in order that we may have a perpetual memorial reply to objection to the figure ceases on the advent of the reality but this sacrament is a figure and a representation of our lord's passion as stated above and therefore on the day on which our lord's passion is recalled as it was really accomplished this sacrament is not consecrated nevertheless lest the church be deprived on that day of the fruit of the passion offered to us by the sacrament the body of christ consecrated the day before is reserved to be consumed on that day but the blood is not reserved on account of danger and because the blood is more especially the image of our lord's passion as stated above in question seventy eight article three second reply nor is it true as some affirm that the wine is changed into blood when the particle of christ's body is dropped into it because this cannot be done otherwise than by consecration under the due form of words on christmas day however several masses are said on account of christ's threefold nativity of these the first is his eternal birth which is hidden in our regard and therefore one mass is sung in the night in the introit of which we say the lord said unto me thou art my son this day i have begotten thee the second is his nativity in time and the spiritual birth whereby christ rises as the day star in our hearts according to second peter one nineteen and on this account the mass is sung at dawn and in the introit we say the light will shine on us today the third is christ's temporal and bodily birth according as he went forth from the virginal womb becoming visible to us through being clothed with flesh and on that account the third mass is sung in broad daylight in the introit of which we say a child is born to us nevertheless on the other hand it can be said that his eternal generation of itself is in the full light and on this account in the gospel of the third mass mention is made of his eternal birth but regarding his birth in the body he was literally born during the night as a sign that he came to the darkness of our infirmity hence also in the midnight mass we say the gospel of christ's nativity in the flesh likewise on other days upon which many of god's benefits have to be recalled or besought several masses are celebrated on one day as for instance one for the feast and another for a fast or for the dead reply to objection three as already observed in question seventy three article five christ wished to give this sacrament last of all in order that it might make a deeper impression on the hearts of the disciples and therefore it was after supper at the close of day that he consecrated this sacrament and gave it to his disciples but we celebrate at the hour when our lord suffered that is either as on feast days at the hour of terce when he was crucified by the tongues of the jews confirm mark fifteen twenty five and when the holy ghost descended upon the disciples confer acts two fifteen or as when no feast is kept at the hour of sext when he was crucified at the hands of the soldiers confer john nineteen fourteen or as on fasting days at none when crying out with a loud voice he gave up the ghost confer matthew twenty seven verses forty six through fifty nevertheless the mass can be postponed especially when holy orders have to be conferred and still more on holy saturday both on account of the length of the office and also because orders belong to the sunday as is set forth in the decretals masses however can be celebrated in the first part of the day owing to any necessity as is stated in on consecration paragraph one 
Reply to Objection 4. As a rule, Mass ought to be said in the day and not in the night, because Christ is present in this sacrament, who says in John 9, verses 4 and 5, I must work the works of him that sent me, whilst it is day, because the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Yet this should be done in such a manner that the beginning of the day is not to be taken from midnight, nor from sunrise, that is, when the substance of the sun appears above the earth, but when the dawn begins to show, because then the sun is said to be risen when the brightness of his beams appears. Accordingly, it is written in Mark 16, verse 1, that the women came to the tomb, the sun being now risen. Though, as John relates in John 20, verse 1, while it was yet dark, they came to the tomb. It is in this way that Augustine explains this difference, in On the Consensus of the Gospels, 3. Exception is made on the night of Christmas Eve, when Mass is celebrated, because our Lord was born in the night. And in like manner it is celebrated on Holy Saturday towards the beginning of the night, since our Lord rose in the night, that is, when it was yet dark, before the sun's rising was manifest. Reply to Objection 5 As is set down in the Decree on Consecration, paragraph 1, in virtue of a decree of Pope Alexander the Second, it is enough for a priest to celebrate one Mass each day, because Christ suffered once and redeemed the whole world, and very happy is he who can worthily celebrate one Mass. But there are some who say one Mass for the dead, and another of the day, if need be. But I do not deem that those escape condemnation who presume to celebrate several Masses daily, either for the sake of money, or to gain flattery from the laity. And Pope Innocent the Third says that, except on the day of our Lord's birth, unless necessity urges, it suffices for a priest to celebrate only one Mass each day. Third Article Whether this sacrament ought to be celebrated in a house and with sacred vessels. Objection 1 it seems that this sacrament ought not to be celebrated in a house and with sacred vessels, for this sacrament is a representation of our Lord's passion. But Christ did not suffer in a house, but outside the city gate, according to Hebrews one twelve, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people by his own blood, suffered without the gate. Therefore, it seems that this sacrament ought not to be celebrated in a house, but rather in the open air. Objection to further. In the celebration of this sacrament, the church ought to imitate the custom of Christ and the apostles. But the house wherein Christ first wrought this sacrament was not consecrated, but merely an ordinary supper room, prepared by the master of the house, as related in Luke 22, verses 11 and 12. Moreover, we read in Acts 2, verse 46, that the apostles were continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They took their meat with gladness. Consequently, there is no need for houses in which this sacrament is celebrated to be consecrated. Objection 3 further. Nothing that is to no purpose ought to be done in the church, which is governed by the Holy Ghost. But it seems useless to consecrate a church or an altar, or such like inanimate things, since they are not capable of receiving grace or spiritual virtue. Therefore, it is unbecoming for such consecrations to be performed in the church. Objection 4. Further, only divine works ought to be recalled with solemnity, according to Psalm 91, verse 5. I shall rejoice in the works of thy hands. Now the consecration of a church or altar is the work of a man, as is also the consecration of the chalice and of the ministers and of other such things. But these latter consecrations are not commemorated in the church. Therefore neither ought the consecration of a church or of an altar to be commemorated with solemnity. Objection 5. 
Further, the truth ought to correspond with the figure. But in the Old Testament, which was a figure of the new, the altar was not made of hewn stones, for it is written in Exodus 20, verse 24, You shall make an altar of earth unto me, and if thou make an altar of stone unto me, thou shalt not build it of hewn stones. Again, the altar is commanded to be made of setem wood, covered with brass, according to Exodus 27, verses 1 and 2, or with gold, according to Exodus 25. Consequently, it seems unfitting for the church to make exclusive use of altars made of stone. Objection 6. Further, the chalice with the paten represents Christ's tomb, which was hewn in a rock, as is narrated in the Gospels. Consequently, the chalice ought to be of stone, and not of gold or of silver or tin. Objection 7. Further, just as gold is the most precious among the materials of the altar vessels, so are cloths of silk the most precious among other cloths. Consequently, since the chalice is of gold, the altar cloths ought to be made of silk and not of linen. Objection 8. Further, the dispensing and ordering of the sacraments belongs to the church's ministers, just as the ordering of temporal affairs is subject to the ruling of secular princes. Hence the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 4.1, Let a man so esteem us as the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. But if anything be done against the ordinances of princes, it is deemed void. Therefore, if the various items mentioned above are suitably commanded by the church's prelates, it seems that the body of Christ could not be consecrated unless they be observed, and so it appears to follow that Christ's words are not sufficient of themselves for consecrating this sacrament, which is contrary to the fact. Consequently, it does not seem fitting for such ordinances to be made touching the celebration of this sacrament. On the contrary, the church's ordinances are Christ's own ordinances, since he said in Matthew 18.20, Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I answer that, there are two things to be considered regarding the equipment of this sacrament. One of these belongs to the representation of the events connected with our Lord's Passion, while the other is connected with the reverence due to the sacrament, in which Christ is contained verily, and not in figure only. Hence we consecrate those things which we make use of in this sacrament, both that we may show our reverence for the sacrament, and in order to represent the holiness which is the effect of the Passion of Christ, according to Hebrews 13.12, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people by his own blood, etc. Reply to Objection 1. This sacrament ought, as a rule, to be celebrated in a house whereby the church is signified, according to 1 Timothy 3.15, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Because outside the church there is no place for the true sacrifice, as Augustine says in one of his letters. And because the church was not to be confined within the territories of the Jewish people, but was to be established throughout the whole world, therefore Christ's passion was not celebrated within the city of the Jews, but in the open country, so that the whole world might serve as a house for Christ's passion. Nevertheless, as is said in On Consecration, paragraph 1, if a church be not to hand, we permit travelers to celebrate Mass in the open air, or in a tent, if there be a consecrated altar table to hand, and the other requisites belonging to the sacred function. Reply to Objection 2. The house in which this sacrament is celebrated denotes the church, and is termed a church, and so it is fittingly consecrated, both to represent the holiness which the church acquired from the Passion, 
as well as to denote the holiness required of them who have to receive this sacrament. By the altar, Christ himself is signified, of whom the Apostle says in Hebrews 13.15, Through him we offer a sacrifice of praise to God. Hence the consecration of the altar signifies Christ's holiness, of which it was said in Luke 1.35, The Holy One born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Hence we read in On Consecration, paragraph 1, It has seemed pleasing for the altars to be consecrated not merely with the anointing of chrism, but likewise with the priestly blessing. And therefore, as a rule, it is not lawful to celebrate this sacrament except in a consecrated house. Hence it is enacted, again in On Consecration, paragraph 1, let no priest presume to say Mass except in places consecrated by the bishop. And furthermore, because pagans and other unbelievers are not members of the church, therefore we read, It is not lawful to bless a church in which the bodies of unbelievers are buried, but if it seems suitable for consecration, then after removing the corpses and tearing down the walls or beams, let it be rebuilt. If, however, it has already been consecrated and the faithful lie in it, it is lawful to celebrate Mass therein. Nevertheless, in a case of necessity, this sacrament can be performed in houses which have not been consecrated, or which have been profaned, but with the bishop's consent. Hence we read in the same distinction, We deem that Masses are not to be celebrated everywhere, but in places consecrated by the bishop, or where he gives permission but not without a portable altar consecrated by the bishop, hence in the same distinction we read, we permit that, if the churches be devastated or burned, masses may be celebrated in chapels with a consecrated altar. For because Christ's holiness is the fount of all the church's holiness, therefore in necessity a consecrated altar suffices for performing this sacrament and on this account a church is never consecrated without consecrating the altar. Yet sometimes an altar is consecrated apart from the church with the relics of the saints, whose lives are hidden with Christ in God, according to Colossians 3.3. 3. Accordingly, under the same distinction we read, It is our pleasure that altars, in which no relics of saints are found enclosed, be thrown down, if possible, by the bishops presiding over such places. Reply to Objection 3. The church, altar, and other like inanimate things are consecrated, not because they are capable of receiving grace, but because they acquire special spiritual virtue from the consecration, whereby they are rendered fit for divine worship, so that man derives devotion therefrom, making him more fitted for divine functions, unless this be hindered by want of reverence. Hence it is written in 2 Maccabees 3.38, There is undoubtedly in that place a certain power of God, for he that hath his dwelling in the heavens is the visitor and the protector of that place. Hence it is that such places are cleansed and exercised before being consecrated, that the enemy's power may be driven forth. And for the same reason, churches defiled by shedding of blood or seed are reconciled, because some machination of the enemy is apparent on account of the sin committed there. And for this reason we read in the same distinction, Wherever you find churches of the Arians, consecrate them as Catholic churches without delay by means of devout prayers and rites. Hence too it is that some say with probability that by entering a consecrated church one obtains forgiveness of venial sins, just as one does by the sprinkling of holy water alleging the words of Psalm 84, verses 2 and 3, Lord, thou hast blessed thy land, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. And therefore, in consequence of the virtue acquired by a church's consecration, the consecration is never repeated. Accordingly, we find in the same distinction the following words quoted from the Council of Nicaea, Churches which have once been consecrated must not be consecrated again, except they be devastated by fire, or defiled by shedding of blood, or of any one's seed. 
because just as a child once baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost ought not to be baptized again, so neither ought a place once dedicated to God to be consecrated again, except owing to the causes mentioned above, provided that the consecrators held faith in the Holy Trinity. In fact, those outside the church cannot consecrate. But as we read in the same distinction, churches or altars of doubtful consecration are to be consecrated anew. And since they acquire a special spiritual virtue from their consecration, we find it laid down in the same distinction that the beams of a dedicated church ought not to be used for any other purpose except it be for some other church, or else they are to be burned, or to put to the use of brethren in some monastery, but on no account are they to be discarded for the works of the laity. We read there, too, that the altar covering, chair, candlesticks, and veil are to be burned when worn out, and their ashes are to be placed in the baptistry, or in the walls, or else cast into the trenches beneath the flagstones, so as not to be defiled by the feet of those that enter. Reply to Objection 4 Since the consecration of the altar signifies Christ's holiness, and the consecration of a house the holiness of the entire church, therefore the consecration of a church or of an altar is more fittingly commemorated. And on this account the solemnity of a church dedication is observed for eight days in order to signify the happy resurrection of Christ and of the church's members. Nor is the consecration of a church or altar man's doing only, since it has a spiritual virtue. Hence in the same distinction it is said, The solemnities of the dedication of churches are to be solemnly celebrated each year, and that dedications are to be kept up for eight days you will find in the third book of Kings, chapter 8, verse 66. Reply to Objection 5 as we read in On Consecration, Distinction 1, altars, if not of stone, are not to be consecrated with the anointing of chrism. And this is in keeping with the signification of this sacrament, both because the altar signifies Christ, for in 1 Corinthians 10.3 it is written, But the rock was Christ, and because Christ's body was laid in a stone sepulchre. This is also in keeping with the use of the sacrament, because stone is solid and may be found everywhere, which was not necessary in the old law when the altar was made in one place. As to the commandment to make the altar of earth or of unhewn stones, this was given in order to remove idolatry. Reply to Objection 6 as is laid down in the same distinction, formerly the priests did not use golden but wooden chalices, but Pope Zephanirus ordered the Mass to be said with glass patens, and subsequently Pope Urban had everything made of silver. Afterwards it was decided that the Lord's chalice with the paten should be made entirely of gold or of silver or at least of tin but it is not to be made of brass or copper, because the action of the wine thereon produces verdigris, and provokes vomiting. But no one is to presume to sing mass with a chalice of wood or of glass, because, as the wood is porous, the consecrated blood would remain in it, while glass is brittle, and there might arise danger of breakage. And the same applies to stone. Consequently, out of reverence for the sacrament, it was enacted that the chalice should be made of the aforesaid materials. Reply to Objection 7 Where it could be done without danger, the Church gave order for that thing to be used which more expressly represents Christ's passion, but there is not so much danger regarding the body which is placed on the corporal as there is with the blood contained in the chalice and consequently, although the chalice is not made of stone, yet the corporal is made of linen, since Christ's body was wrapped therein. Hence we read in an epistle of Pope Sylvester, quoted in the same distinction, By a unanimous decree, 
we command that no one shall presume to celebrate the sacrifice of the altar upon a cloth of silk or dyed material but upon linen consecrated by the bishop as christ's body was buried in a clean linen winding sheet moreover linen material is becoming owing to its cleanness to denote purity of conscience and owing to the manifold labor with which it is prepared to denote christ's passion reply to objection eight the dispensing of the sacraments belongs to the church's ministers but their consecration is from god himself consequently the church's ministers can make no ordinances regarding the form of consecration and the manner of celebrating and therefore if the priest pronounces the words of consecration over the proper matter with the intention of consecrating then without every one of the things mentioned above namely without house and altar consecrated chalice and corporal and the other things instituted by the church he consecrates christ's body in very truth yet he is guilty of grave sin in not following the right of the church End of question 83, part 1, read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 83, part 2, of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 83 of the Right of this Sacrament in Six Articles, Part 2, Articles 4 through 6. Fourth Article Whether the words spoken in this sacrament are properly framed. Objection 1. It seems that the words spoken in this sacrament are not properly framed. For as Ambrose says in On the Sacraments 4, this sacrament is consecrated with Christ's own words. Therefore, no other words besides Christ's should be spoken in this sacrament. Objection to further. Christ's words and deeds are made known to us through the gospel. But in consecrating this sacrament, words are used which are not set down in the gospels. For we do not read in the gospel of Christ lifting up his eyes to heaven while consecrating this sacrament. And similarly it is said in the gospel, Take ye and eat, comedite, without the addition of the word all. Whereas in celebrating this sacrament we say, Lifting up his eyes to heaven. And again, Take ye and eat, manducate, of this therefore such words as these are out of place when spoken in the celebration of this sacrament objection three further all the other sacraments are ordained for the salvation of all the faithful but in the celebration of the other sacraments there is no common prayer put up for the salvation of all the faithful and of the departed consequently it is unbecoming in this sacrament objection four further baptism especially is called the sacrament of faith consequently the truths which belong to the instruction in the faith ought rather to be given regarding baptism than regarding this sacrament such as the doctrine of the apostle and of the gospels objection five further devotion on the part of the faithful is required in every sacrament consequently the devotion of the faithful ought not to be stirred up in this sacrament more than in the others by divine praises and by admonitions such as lift up your hearts objection six further the minister of this sacrament is the priest as stated above in question eighty two article one consequently all the words spoken in this sacrament ought to be uttered by the priest and not some by the ministers and some by the choir Objection 7 further. The divine power works this sacrament unfailingly. Therefore, it is to no purpose that the priest asks for the perfecting of this sacrament, saying, Which oblation do thou, O God, in all, etc.? 
Objection 8 further. The sacrifice of the new law is much more excellent than the sacrifice of the fathers of old. Therefore it is unfitting for the priest to pray that this sacrifice may be as acceptable as the sacrifice of Abraham and Melchizedek. Objection 9. Further, just as Christ's body does not begin to be in this sacrament by change of place, as stated above in question 75, article 2, so likewise neither does it cease to be there. Consequently, it is improper for the priest to ask, Bid these things be borne by the hands of thy holy angel unto thine altar on high. On the contrary, we find it stated in On Consecration, Distinction 1, that James the brother of the Lord according to the flesh, and Basil, bishop of Caesarea, edited the right of celebrating the Mass. And from their authority it is manifest that whatever words are employed in this matter are chosen becomingly. I answer that, since the whole mystery of our salvation is comprised in this sacrament, therefore it is performed with greater solemnity than the other sacraments and since it is written in ecclesiastes four seventeen keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of god and in ecclesiasticus eighteen twenty three before prayer prepare thy soul therefore the celebration of this mystery is preceded by a certain preparation in order that we may perform worthily that which follows thereafter the first part of this preparation is divine praise and consists in the introit according to psalm forty nine twenty three the sacrifice of praise shall glorify me and there is the way by which i will show him the salvation of god and this is taken for the most part from the psalms or at least is sung with the psalm because as dionysius says in the ecclesiastical hierarchy three the psalms comprise by way of praise whatever is contained in sacred scripture the second part contains a reference to our present misery by reason of which we pray for mercy saying lord have mercy on us thrice for the person of the father and christ have mercy on us thrice for the person of the son and lord have mercy on us thrice for the person of the holy ghost against the threefold misery of ignorance sin and punishment or else to express the circumincession of all the divine persons. The third part commemorates the heavenly glory, to the possession of which, after this life of misery, we are tending in the words, Glory be to God on high, which are sung on festival days, on which the heavenly glory is commemorated, but are omitted in those sorrowful offices which commemorate our unhappy state. The fourth part contains the prayer which the priest makes for the people, that they may be made worthy of such great mysteries. There precedes, in the second place, the instruction of the faithful, because this sacrament is a mystery of faith, as stated above, in question 78, article 3, fifth reply. Now this instruction is given dispositively, when the lectors and subdeacons read aloud in the church the teachings of the prophets and apostles. After this lesson, the choir sing the gradual, which signifies progress in life. Then the Alleluia is intoned, and this denotes spiritual joy. Or in mournful offices, the tract, expressive of spiritual sighing. For all these things ought to result from the aforesaid teaching. But the people are instructed perfectly by Christ's teaching contained in the gospel, which is read by the higher ministers, that is, by the deacons. And because we believe Christ as the divine truth, according to John 8.46, If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? After the gospel has been read, the creed is sung, in which the people show that they assent by faith to Christ's doctrine. And it is sung on those festivals of which mention is made therein, as on the festivals of Christ, of the Blessed Virgin, and of the Apostles, who laid the foundations of this faith, and on other such days. So then, after the people have been prepared and instructed, the next step is to proceed to the celebration of the mystery, which is both offered as a sacrifice and consecrated and received as a sacrament. Since first we have the oblation, then the consecration of the matter offered, and thirdly, its reception. 
In regard to the oblation, two things are done, namely, the people's praise in singing the offertory, expressing the joy of the offerers, and the priest's prayer asking for the people's oblation to be made acceptable to God. Hence David said, In the simplicity of my heart I have offered all these things, and I have seen with great joy thy people which are here present offer thee their offerings. And then he makes the following prayer. O Lord God, keep this will. Then regarding the consecration performed by supernatural power, the people are first of all excited to devotion in the preface, hence they are admonished to lift up their hearts to the Lord. And therefore when the preface is ended, the people devoutly praise Christ's Godhead, saying with the angels, Holy, holy, holy and his humanity, saying with the children, Blessed is he that cometh. In the next place, the priest makes a commemoration, first of those for whom the sacrifice is offered, namely for the whole church, and for those set in high places, according to First Timothy 2.2, 2, and in a special manner of them who offer or for whom the Mass is offered. Secondly, he commemorates the saints invoking their patronage for those mentioned above when he says, communicating with and honoring the memory, etc. Thirdly, he concludes the petition when he says, wherefore that this oblation, etc., in order that the oblation may be salutary to them for whom it is offered. Then he comes to the consecration itself. Here he asks first of all for the effect of the consecration when he says, which oblation do thou, O God, etc. Secondly, he performs the consecration using our Saviour's words when he says, Who the day before, etc. Thirdly, he makes excuse for his presumption in obeying God's command, saying, Wherefore calling to mind, etc. Fourthly, he asks that the sacrifice accomplished may find favor with God when he says, Look down upon them with a propitious etc. Fifthly, he begs for the effect of this sacrifice and sacrament, first for the partaker, saying, We humbly beseech thee. Then for the dead, who can no longer receive it, saying, Be mindful also, O Lord, etc. Sixthly, for the priests themselves who offer, saying, And to us sinners, etc. Then follows the act of receiving the sacrament. First of all, the people are prepared for communion, first by the common prayer of the congregation, which is the Lord's Prayer, in which we ask for our daily bread to be given us, and also by private prayer, which the priest puts up specially for the people when he says, Deliver us, we beseech thee, O Lord, etc. Secondly, the people are prepared by the pax, which is given with the words, Lamb of God, etc., because this is the sacrament of unity and peace, as stated above, in question 73, article 4, and in question 79, article 1. But in masses for the dead, in which the sacrifice is offered not for present peace, but for the repose of the dead, the pax is omitted. Then follows the reception of the sacrament, the priest receiving first, and afterwards giving it to others, because as Dionysius says in the Ecclesiastical Hierarchy 3, he who gives divine things to others ought first to partake thereof himself. Finally, the whole celebration of Mass ends with the thanksgiving, the people rejoicing for having received the mystery, and this is the meaning of the singing after the communion, and the priest returning thanks by prayer as Christ at the close of the supper with his disciples, said a hymn, according to Matthew 26.30. Reply to Objection 1. The consecration is accomplished by Christ's words only, but the other words must be added to dispose the people for receiving it, as stated above. Reply to Objection 2. As is stated in the last chapter of John, verse 25, our Lord said and did many things which are not written down by the evangelists, and among them is the uplifting of his eyes to heaven at the supper. Nevertheless, the Roman church had it by tradition from the apostles. 
for it seems reasonable that he who lifted up his eyes to the Father in raising Lazarus to life, as is related in John 11.41, and in the prayer which he made for the disciples in John 17.1, had more reason to do so in instituting this sacrament as being of greater import. The use of the word manducate instead of comedite makes no difference in the meaning, nor does the expression signify, especially since those words are no part of the form, as stated above, in question 78, article 1, second and fourth replies. The additional word all is understood in the Gospels, although not expressed, because he had said in John 6.54, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you shall not have life in you. Reply to Objection 3. The Eucharist is the sacrament of the unity of the whole Church, and therefore in this sacrament, more than in the others, mention ought to be made of all that belongs to the salvation of the entire Church. Reply to Objection 4. There is a twofold instruction in the faith. The first is for those receiving it for the first time, that is to say, for catechumens and such instruction is given in connection with baptism. The other is the instruction of the faithful who take part in this sacrament, and such instruction is given in connection with this sacrament. Nevertheless, catechumens and unbelievers are not excluded therefrom. Hence in On Consecration, Distinction 1, it is laid down, Let the bishop hinder no one from entering the church and hearing the word of God, be they Gentiles, heretics, or Jews, until the Mass of the Catechumens begins, in which the instruction regarding the faith is contained. Reply to Objection 5. Greater devotion is required in this sacrament than in the others, for the reason that the entire Christ is contained therein. Moreover, this sacrament requires a more general devotion, that is, on the part of the whole people, since for them it is offered and not merely on the part of the recipients, as in the other sacraments. Hence, Cyprian observes in On the Lord's Prayer 31, The priest, in saying the preface, disposes the souls of the brethren by saying, Lift up your hearts, and when the people answer, We have lifted them up to the Lord, let them remember that they are to think of nothing else but God. Reply to Objection 6 As was said above in the third reply, those things are mentioned in this sacrament which belong to the entire church, and consequently, some things which refer to the people are sung by the choir, and some of these words are all sung by the choir, as though inspiring the entire people with them. And there are other words which the priest begins and the people take up, and the priest then acting as in the person of God, to show that the things they denote have come to the people through divine revelation, such as faith and heavenly glory and therefore the priest intones the creed and the gloria in excelsis deo. Other words are uttered by the ministers, such as the doctrine of the Old and New Testament, as a sign that this doctrine was announced to the peoples through ministers sent by God. And there are other words which the priest alone recites, namely, such as belong to his personal office, that he may offer up gifts and prayers for the people, according to Hebrews 5.1. Some of these, however, he says aloud, namely, such as are common to priest and people alike, such as the common prayers. Other words, however, belong to the priest alone, such as the oblation and the consecration. Consequently, the prayers that are said in connection with these have to be said by the priest in secret. Nevertheless, in both he calls the people to attention by saying, The Lord be with you, and he waits for them to assent by saying, Amen. And therefore before the secret prayers he says aloud, The Lord be with you, and he concludes, For ever and ever. Or the priest secretly pronounces some of the words as a token that regarding Christ's passion, the disciples acknowledged him only in secret. Reply to Objection 7. The efficacy of the sacramental words can be hindered by the priest's intention nor is there anything unbecoming in our asking of God for what we know he will do, just as Christ, in John 17, verses 1 and 5, asked for his glorification. 
but the priest does not seem to pray there for the consecration to be fulfilled but that it may be fruitful in our regard hence he says expressively that it may become to us the body and the blood again the words preceding have that meaning when he says vouchsafe to make this oblation blessed that is according to augustine that we may receive a blessing namely through grace enrolled that is that we may be enrolled in heaven ratified that is that we may be incorporated in christ reasonable that is that we may be stripped of our animal sense acceptable that is that we who in ourselves are displeasing may by its means be made acceptable to his only son reply to objection eight although this sacrament is of itself preferable to all ancient sacrifices yet the sacrifices of the men of old were most acceptable to god on account of their devotion consequently the priest asks that this sacrifice may be accepted by god through the devotion of the offerers just as the former sacrifices were accepted by him reply to objection nine the priest does not pray that the sacramental species may be borne up to heaven nor that christ's true body may be borne thither for it does not cease to be there but he offers this prayer for christ's mystical body which is signified in this sacrament that the angel standing by at the divine mysteries may present to god the prayers of both priest and people according to apocalypse eight four and the smoke of the incense of the prayers of the saints ascended up before god from the hand of the angel but god's altar on high means either the church triumphant unto which we pray to be translated or else god himself in whom we ask to share because it is said of this altar in exodus twenty twenty six thou shalt not go up by steps unto my altar that is thou shalt make no steps towards the trinity or else by the angel we are to understand christ himself who is the angel of great counsel according to isaiah nine six who unites his mystical body with god the father and the church triumphant and from this the mass derives its name misa because the priest sends mitit his prayers up to god through the angel as the people do through the priest or else because christ is the victim sent misa to us accordingly the deacon on festival days dismisses the people at the end of mass by saying ite misa est that is the victim has been sent misa est to god through the angel so that it may be accepted by god fifth article whether the actions performed in celebrating this sacrament are becoming objection one it seems that the actions performed in celebrating this mystery are not becoming for as is evident from its form this sacrament belongs to the new testament but under the new testament the ceremonies of the old are not to be observed such as that the priests and ministers were purified with water when they drew nigh to offer up the sacrifice for we read in exodus thirty verses nineteen and twenty aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and feet when they are going into the tabernacle of the testimony and when they are to come to the altar therefore it is not fitting that the priest should wash his hands when celebrating mass objection to further in exodus thirty verse seven the lord commanded aaron to burn sweet-smelling incense upon the altar which was before the propitiatory and the same action was part of the ceremonies of the old law therefore it is not fitting for the priest to use incense during mass objection three further the ceremonies performed in the sacraments of the church ought not to be repeated consequently it is not proper for the priest to repeat the sign of the cross many times over this sacrament objection four further the apostle says in hebrews seven seven and without all contradiction that which is less is blessed by the better but christ who is in this sacrament after the consecration is much greater than the priest therefore 
quite unseemingly the priest after the consecration blesses this sacrament by signing it with the cross objection five further nothing which appears ridiculous ought to be done in one of the church's sacraments but it seems ridiculous to perform gestures that is for the priest to stretch out his arms at times to join his hands to join together his fingers and to bow down consequently such things ought not to be done in this sacrament objection six further it seems ridiculous for the priest to turn round frequently towards the people and often to greet the people consequently such things ought not to be done in the celebration of this sacrament objection seven further the apostle in first corinthians thirteen deems it improper for christ to be divided but christ is in this sacrament after the consecration therefore it is not proper for the priest to divide the host objection eight further the ceremonies performed in the sacrament represent christ's passion but during the passion christ's body was divided in the places of the five wounds therefore christ's body ought to be broken into five parts rather than into three objection nine further christ's entire body is consecrated in the sacrament apart from the blood consequently it is not proper for a particle of the body to be mixed with the blood objection ten further just as in this sacrament christ's body is set before us as food so is his blood as drink but in receiving christ's body no other bodily food is added in the celebration of the mass therefore it is out of place for the priest after taking christ's blood to receive other wine which is not consecrated objection eleven further the truth ought to be conformable with the figure but regarding the paschal lamb which was a figure of this sacrament it was commanded that nothing of it should remain until the morning it is improper therefore for the consecrated hosts to be reserved and not consumed at once objection twelve further the priest addresses in the plural number those who are hearing mass when he says the lord be with you and let us return thanks but it is out of keeping to address one individual in the plural number especially an inferior consequently it seems unfitting for a priest to say mass with only a single server present therefore in the celebration of this sacrament it seems that some of the things done are out of place on the contrary the custom of the church stands for these things and the church cannot err since she is taught by the holy ghost i answer that as was said above in question sixty article six there is a twofold manner of signification in the sacraments by words and by actions in order that the signification may thus be more perfect now in the celebration of the sacrament words are used to signify things pertaining to christ's passion which is represented in the sacrament or again pertaining to christ's mystical body which is signified therein and again things pertaining to the use of this sacrament which use ought to be devout and reverent consequently in the celebration of this mystery some things are done in order to represent christ's passion or the disposing of his mystical body and some others are done which pertain to the devotion and reverence due to the sacrament reply to objection one the washing of the hands is done in the celebration of mass out of reverence for the sacrament and this for two reasons first because we are not wont to handle precious objects except the hands be washed hence it seems indecent for any one to approach so great a sacrament with hands that are even literally unclean secondly on account of its signification because as dionysius says in on the ecclesiastical hierarchy three the washing of the extremities of the limbs denotes cleansing from even the smallest sins according to john thirteen ten he that is washed needeth not but to wash his feet 
and such cleansing is required of him who approaches this sacrament, and this is denoted by the confession which is made before the introit of the Mass. Moreover, this was signified by the washing of the priests under the old law, as Dionysius says. However, the Church observes this ceremony not because it was prescribed under the old law, but because it is becoming in itself, and therefore instituted by the Church. Hence it is not observed in the same way as it was then, because the washing of the feet is omitted, and the washing of the hands is observed. For this can be done more readily, and suffices for denoting perfect cleansing. For since the hand is the organ of organs, according to On the Soul 3, all works are attributed to the hands. Hence it is said in Psalm 25, verse 6, I will wash my hands among the innocent. Reply to Objection 2. We use incense not as commanded by a ceremonial precept of the law, but as prescribed by the church. Accordingly, we do not use it in the same fashion as it was ordered under the old law. It has reference to two things. First, to the reverence due to the sacrament, that is, in order by its good odor to remove any disagreeable smell that may be about the place. Secondly, it serves to show the effect of grace, wherewith Christ was filled as with a good odor, according to Genesis 27.27. Behold, the order of my son is like the order of a ripe field. And from Christ it spreads to the faithful by the work of his ministers, according to 2 Corinthians 2.14. He manifesteth the order of his knowledge by us in every place. And therefore, when the altar, which represents Christ, has been incensed on every side, then all are incensed in their proper order. Reply to Objection 3. The priest, in celebrating the Mass, makes use of the sign of the cross to signify Christ's passion, which was ended upon the cross. Now Christ's passion was accomplished in certain stages. First of all, there was Christ's betrayal, which was the work of God, of Judas, and of the Jews. And this is signified by the triple sign of the cross at the words, These gifts, these presents, these holy unspotted sacrifices. Secondly, there was the selling of Christ. Now he was sold to the priests, to the scribes, and to the Pharisees. And to signify this, the threefold sign of the cross is repeated at the words, blessed, enrolled, ratified. Or again, to signify the price for which he was sold, namely thirty pence. And a double cross is added at the words, that it may become to us the body and the blood, etc., to signify the person of Judas the seller and of Christ who was sold. Thirdly, there was the foreshadowing of the Passion at the Last Supper. To denote this, in the third place, two crosses are made, one in consecrating the body, the other in consecrating the blood, each time while saying, He blessed. Fourthly, there was Christ's Passion itself, and so in order to represent his five wounds in the fourth place, there is a five-fold signing of the cross at the words, a pure victim, a holy victim, a spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the cup of everlasting salvation. Fifthly, the outstretching of Christ's body and the shedding of the blood and the fruits of the passion are signified by the triple signing of the cross at the words, as many as shall receive, the body and blood may be filled with every blessing, etc. Sixthly, Christ's threefold prayer upon the cross is represented, one for his persecutors when he said, Father, forgive them, the second for deliverance from death when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The third referring to his entrance into glory when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in order to denote these three, there is a triple signing with a cross made at the words, Thou dost sanctify, quicken, bless. Seventhly, the three hours during which he hung upon the cross, that is, from the sixth to the ninth hour, are represented, in signification of which 
we make once more a triple sign of the cross at the words through him and with him and in him eighthly the separation of his soul from the body is signified by the two subsequent crosses made over the chalice ninthly the resurrection on the third day is represented by the three crosses made at the words may the peace of the lord be ever with you in short we may say that the consecration of this sacrament and the acceptance of this sacrifice and its fruits proceed from the virtue of the cross of christ and therefore wherever mention is made of these the priest makes use of the sign of the cross reply to objection four after the consecration the priest makes the sign of the cross not for the purpose of blessing and consecrating but only for calling to mind the virtue of the cross and the manner of christ's suffering as is evident from what has been said above in the third reply reply to objection five the actions performed by the priest in mass are not ridiculous gestures since they are done so as to represent something else the priest in extending his arms signifies the outstretching of christ's arms upon the cross he also lifts up his hands as he prays to point out that his prayer is directed to god for the people according to lamentations three forty one let us lift up our hearts with our hands to the lord in the heavens and in exodus seventeen eleven and when moses lifted up his hands israel overcame that at times he joins his hands and bows down praying earnestly and humbly denotes the humility and obedience of christ out of which he suffered he closes his fingers that is the thumb and first finger after the consecration because with them he had touched the consecrated body of christ so that if any particle cling to the fingers it may not be scattered and this belongs to the reverence for this sacrament reply to objection six five times does the priest turn round towards the people to denote that our lord manifested himself five times on the day of his resurrection as stated above in the treatise on christ's redemption question five article three but the priest greets the people seven times namely five times by turning round to the people and twice without turning round namely when he says the lord be with you before the preface and again when he says may the peace of the lord be ever with you and this is to denote the sevenfold grace of the holy ghost but a bishop when he celebrates on festival days in his first greeting says peace be to you which was our lord's greeting after his resurrection whose person the bishop chiefly represents reply to objection seven the breaking of the host denotes three things first the rending of christ's body which took place in the passion secondly the distinction of his mystical body according to its various states and thirdly the distribution of the graces which flow from christ's passion as dionysius observes in the ecclesiastical hierarchy three hence this breaking does not imply severance in christ reply to objection eight as pope sergius says and it is to be found in the decretals in unconsecration distinction two the lord's body is threefold the part offered and put into the chalice signifies christ's risen body namely christ himself and the virgin mary and the other saints if there be any who are already in glory with their bodies the part consumed denotes those still walking upon earth because while living upon earth they are united together by the sacrament and are bruised by the passions just as the bread eaten is bruised by the teeth the part reserved on the altar till the close of the mass is his body hidden in the sepulchre because the bodies of the saints will be in their graves until the end of the world though their souls are either in purgatory or in heaven however this right of reserving one part on the altar till the close of mass is no longer observed on account of the danger nevertheless the same meaning of the parts continues which some persons have expressed in verse thus the host being rent what is dipped means the blessed what is dry means the living what is kept those at rest 
Others, however, say that the part put into the chalice denotes those still living in this world, while the part kept outside the chalice denotes those fully blessed both in soul and body, while the part consumed means the others. Reply to Objection 9. Two things can be signified by the chalice. First, the passion itself, which is represented in this sacrament, and according to this, by the part put into the chalice are denoted those who are still sharers of Christ's sufferings. Secondly, the enjoyment of the blessed can be signified, which is likewise foreshadowed in this sacrament. And therefore, those whose bodies are already in full beatitude are denoted by the part put into the chalice. And it is to be observed that the part put into the chalice ought not to be given to the people to supplement the communion, because Christ gave dipped bread only to Judas the betrayer. Reply to Objection 10. Wine, by reason of its humidity, is capable of washing. Consequently, it is received in order to rinse the mouth after receiving the sacrament, lest any particles remain, and this belongs to reverence for the sacrament. Hence it is said, the priest should always cleanse his mouth with wine after receiving the entire sacrament of Eucharist, except when he has to celebrate another Mass on the same day, lest from taking the ablution wine he be prevented from celebrating again. And it is for the same reason that wine is poured over the fingers with which he had touched the body of Christ. Reply to Objection 11. The truth ought to be conformable with the figure, in some respect, namely, because a part of the host consecrated, of which the priest and ministers or even the people communicate, ought not to be reserved until the day following. Hence, as is laid down, Pope Clement I ordered that, as many hosts are to be offered on the altar as shall suffice for the people, should any be left over, they are not to be reserved until the morrow, but let the clergy carefully consume them with fear and trembling. Nevertheless, since this sacrament is to be received daily, whereas the paschal lamb was not, it is therefore necessary for other hosts to be reserved for the sick. Hence we read in the same distinction, Let the priest always have the Eucharist ready, so that when any one falls sick he may take communion to him at once, lest he die without it. Reply to Objection 12 Several persons ought to be present at the solemn celebration of the Mass. Hence Pope Soter said, It has been also ordained that no priest is to presume to celebrate solemn mass unless two others be present answering him while he himself makes the third. Because when he says in the plural, The Lord be with you, and again in the secrets, Pray ye for me, it is most becoming that they should answer his greeting. Hence it is for the sake of greater solemnity that we find it decreed that a bishop is to solemnize Mass with several assistants. Nevertheless, in private Masses it suffices to have one server who takes the place of the whole Catholic people on whose behalf he makes answer in the plural to the priest. Sixth Article Whether the defects occurring during the celebration of the sacrament can be sufficiently met by observing the Church's statutes. Objection 1. It seems that the defects occurring during the celebration of the sacrament cannot be sufficiently met by observing the statutes of the Church. For it sometimes happens that before or after the consecration, the priest dies or goes mad, or is hindered by some other infirmity from receiving the sacrament and completing the Mass. Consequently, it seems impossible to observe the Church's statute whereby the priest consecrating must communicate of his own sacrifice. Objection to further. It sometimes happens that, before consecration, the priest remembers that he has eaten or drunk something, or that he is in mortal sin or under excommunication which he did not remember previously. Therefore, in such a dilemma, a man must necessarily commit mortal sin by acting against the church's statute, whether he receives or not. Objection 3 further. It sometimes happens that a fly or a spider or some other poisonous creature falls into the chalice after the consecration, 
or even that the priest comes to know that poison has been put in by some evilly disposed person in order to kill him now in this instance if he takes it he appears to sin by killing himself or by tempting god also in like manner if he does not take it he sins by acting against the church's statute consequently he seems to be perplexed and under necessity of sinning which is not becoming objection for further it sometimes happens from the server's want of heed that water is not added to the chalice or even the wine overlooked and that the priest discovers this therefore he seems to be perplexed likewise in this case whether he receives the body without the blood thus making the sacrifice to be incomplete or whether he receives neither the body nor the blood objection five further it sometimes happens that the priest cannot remember having said the words of consecration or other words which are uttered in the celebration of the sacrament in this case he seems to sin whether he repeats the words over the same matter which words possibly he has said before or whether he uses bread and wine which are not consecrated as if they were consecrated objection six further it sometimes comes to pass owing to the cold that the host will slip from the priest's hands into the chalice either before or after the breaking in this case then the priest will not be able to comply with the church's right either as to the breaking or else as to this that only a third part is put into the chalice objection seven further sometimes too it happens owing to the priest's want of care that christ's blood is spilled or that he vomits the sacrament received or that the consecrated hosts are kept so long that they become corrupt or that they are nibbled by mice or lost in any other manner whatsoever in which cases it does not seem possible for due reverence to be shown towards this sacrament as the church's ordinances require it does not seem then that such defects or dangers can be met by keeping to the church's statutes on the contrary just as god does not command an impossibility so neither does the church i answer that dangers or defects happening to the sacrament can be met in two ways first by preventing any such mishaps from occurring secondly by dealing with them in such a way that what may have happened amiss is put right either by employing a remedy or at least by repentance on his part who has acted negligently regarding this sacrament reply to objection one if the priest be stricken by death or grave sickness before the consecration of our lord's body and blood there is no need for it to be completed by another but if this happens after the consecration is begun for instance when the body has been consecrated and before the consecration of the blood or even after both have been consecrated then the celebration of the mass ought to be finished by someone else hence as is laid down we read the following decree of the seventh council of toledo we consider it to be fitting that when the sacred mysteries are consecrated by priests during the time of mass if any sickness supervenes in consequence of which they cannot finish the mystery begun let it be free for the bishop or another priest to finish the consecration of the office thus begun for nothing else is suitable for completing the mysteries commenced unless the consecration be completed either by the priest who began it or by the one who follows him because they cannot be completed except they be performed in perfect order for since we are all one in christ the change of persons makes no difference since unity of faith ensures the happy issue of the mystery yet let not the course we propose for cases of natural debility be presumptuously abused and let no minister or priest presume ever to leave the divine offices unfinished unless he be absolutely prevented from continuing if any one shall have rashly presumed to do so he will incur sentence of excommunication reply to objection to where difficulty arises the less dangerous course should always be followed but the greatest danger regarding the sacrament lies in whatever may prevent its completion because this is a heinous sacrilege 
while that danger is of less account which regards the condition of the receiver. Consequently, if after the consecration has begun, the priest remembers that he has eaten or drunk anything, he ought nevertheless to complete the sacrifice and receive the sacrament. Likewise, if he recalls a sin committed, he ought to make an act of contrition with the firm purpose of confessing and making satisfaction for it, and thus he will not receive the sacrament unworthily, but with profit. The same applies if he calls to mind that he is under some excommunication, for he ought to make the resolution of humbly seeking absolution, and so he will receive absolution from the invisible high priest Jesus Christ for his act of completing the divine mysteries. But if he calls to mind any of the above facts previous to the consecration, I should deem it safer for him to interrupt the mass begun, especially if he has broken his fast or is under excommunication, unless grave scandal were to be feared. Reply to Objection 3. If a fly or a spider falls into the chalice before consecration, or if it be discovered that the wine is poisoned, it ought to be poured out and after purifying the chalice, fresh wine should be served for consecration. But if anything of the sort happen after the consecration, the insect should be caught carefully and washed thoroughly, then burned, and the ablution, together with the ashes, thrown into the sacrarium. If it be discovered that the wine has been poisoned, the priest should neither receive it nor administer it to others on any account, lest the life-giving chalice become one of death, but it ought to be kept in a suitable vessel with the relics. And in order that the sacrament may not remain incomplete, he ought to put other wine into the chalice, resume the mass from the consecration of the blood, and complete the sacrifice. Reply to Objection 4. If before the consecration of the blood, and after the consecration of the body, the priest detect that either the wine or the water is absent, then he ought at once to add them and consecrate. But if after the words of consecration he discover that the water is absent, he ought notwithstanding to proceed straight on, because the addition of the water is not necessary for the sacrament as stated above, in question 74, article 7. Nevertheless, the person responsible for the neglect ought to be punished, and on no account should water be mixed with the consecrated wine, because corruption of the sacrament would ensue in part, as was said above, in question 77, article 8. But if, after the words of consecration, the priest perceive that no wine has been put in the chalice, and if he detect it before receiving the body, then rejecting the water he ought to pour in wine with water, and begin over again the consecrating words of the blood. But if he notice it after receiving the body, he ought to procure another host which must be consecrated together with the blood. And I say so for this reason, because if he were to say only the words of consecration of the blood, the proper order of consecrating would not be observed, and, as is laid down by the Council of Toledo, quoted above, sacrifices cannot be perfect, except they be performed in perfect order. But if he were to begin from the consecration of the blood, and were to repeat all the words which follow, it would not suffice unless there was a consecrated host present, since in those words there are things to be said and done not only regarding the blood, but also regarding the body. And at the close, he ought once more to receive the consecrated host and blood, even if he had already taken the water which was in the chalice, because the precept of the completing of the sacrament is of greater weight than the precept of receiving the sacrament while fasting, as stated above in question 80, article 8. Reply to Objection 5. Although the priest may not recollect having said some of the words he ought to say, he ought not to be disturbed mentally on that account. For a man who utters many words cannot recall to mind all that he has said, unless perchance in uttering them he adverts to something connected with the consecration. For so it is impressed on the memory. Hence, if a man pays attention to what he is saying, but without adverting to the fact that he is saying these particular words, he remembers soon after that he has said them, for a thing is presented to the memory under the formality of the past, according to On Memory and Reminiscence 1. 
But if it seem to the priest that he has probably omitted some of the words that are not necessary for the sacrament, I think that he ought not to repeat them on that account, changing the order of the sacrifice, but that he ought to proceed. If he is certain that he has left out any of those that are necessary for the sacrament, namely, the form of the consecration, since the form of the consecration is necessary for the sacrament, just as the matter is, it seems that the same thing ought to be done as was stated above in the fourth reply with regard to defect in the matter, namely, that he should begin again with the form of the consecration and repeat the other things in order, lest the order of the sacrifice be altered. Reply to Objection 6. The breaking of the consecrated host and the putting of only one part into the chalice regards the mystical body, just as the mixing with water signifies the people, and therefore the omission of either of them causes no such imperfection in the sacrifice, as calls for repetition regarding the celebration of the sacrament. Reply to Objection 7. According to the decree on consecration, distinction 2, quoting a decree of Pope Pius I, if from neglect any of the blood falls upon a board which is fixed to the ground, let it be taken up with the tongue, and let the board be scraped. But if it be not a board, let the ground be scraped, and the scrapings burned, and the ashes buried inside the altar, and let the priest do penance for forty days. But if a drop fall from the chalice onto the altar, let the minister suck up the drop, and do penance during three days. And if it fall upon the altar cloth and penetrates to the second altar cloth, let him do four days penance. If it penetrates to the third, let him do nine days penance. If to the fourth, let him do twenty days penance. And let the altar linens which the drop touched be washed three times by the priest, holding the chalice below. Then let the water be taken and put away nigh to the altar. It might even be drunk by the minister unless it might be rejected from nausea. Some persons go further and cut out that part of the linen which they burn, putting the ashes in the altar or down the sacrarium. And the decretal continues with a quotation from the penitential of Bede the priest. If, owing to drunkenness or gluttony, any one vomits up the Eucharist, let him do forty days' penance, if he be a layman. But let clerics or monks, deacons and priests, do seventy days' penance, and let a bishop do ninety days. But if they vomit from sickness, let them do penance for seven days. And in the same distinction we read a decree of the Fourth Council of Arles, they who do not keep proper custody over the sacrament, if a mouse or other animal consume it, must do forty days' penance. He who loses it in a church, or if a part fall and not be found, shall do thirty days' penance. And the priest seems to deserve the same penance, who from neglect allows the host to putrefy. And on those days the one doing penance ought to fast and abstain from communion. However, after weighing the circumstances of the fact and of the person, the said penances may be lessened or increased. But it must be observed that wherever the species are found to be entire, they must be preserved reverently or consumed, because Christ's body is there so long as the species last, as stated above in question 77, articles 4 and 5. But if it can be done conveniently, the things in which they are found are to be burned, and the ashes put in the sacrarium, as was said of the scrapings of the altar table here above. End of question 83 Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 84, Part 1 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 84 of the Sacrament of Penance in Ten Articles. Part 1, Articles 1 through 5. We must now consider the sacrament of penance. 
we shall consider one penance itself two its effects three its parts four the recipients of this sacrament five the power of the ministers which pertains to the keys six the solemnization of this sacrament the first of these considerations will be twofold one penance as a sacrament two penance as a virtue under the first head there are ten points of inquiry first whether penance is a sacrament second of its proper matter third of its form fourth whether imposition of hands is necessary for the sacrament fifth whether this sacrament is necessary for salvation sixth of its relation to the other sacraments seventh of its institution eighth of its duration ninth of its continuance tenth whether it can be repeated first article whether penance is a sacrament objection one it would seem that penance is not a sacrament for gregory says the sacraments are baptism chrism and the body and blood of christ which are called sacraments because under the veil of corporeal things the divine power works out salvation in a hidden manner but this does not happen in penance because therein corporeal things are not employed that under them the power of god may work our salvation therefore penance is not a sacrament objection to further the sacraments of the church are shown forth by the ministers of christ according to first corinthians four one let a man so account of us as of the ministers of christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of god but penance is not conferred by the ministers of christ but is inspired inwardly into man by god according to jeremiah thirty one verse nineteen after thou didst convert me i did penance therefore it seems that penance is not a sacrament objection three further in the sacraments of which we have already spoken above there is something that is sacrament only something that is both reality and sacrament and something that is reality only as is clear from what has been stated above in question sixty six article one but this does not apply to penance therefore penance is not a sacrament on the contrary as baptism is conferred that we may be cleansed from sin so also is penance wherefore peter said to simon magus in acts eight twenty two do penance from this thy wickedness but baptism is a sacrament as stated above in question sixty six article one therefore for the same reason penance is also a sacrament i answer that as gregory says a sacrament consists in a solemn act whereby something is done that we understand it to signify the holiness which it confers now it is evident that in penance something is done so that something holy is signified both on the part of the penitent sinner and on the part of the priest absolving because the penitent sinner by deed and word shows his heart to have renounced sin and in like manner the priest by his deed and word with regard to the penitent signifies the work of god who forgives his sins therefore it is evident that penance as practiced in the church is a sacrament reply to objection one by corporeal things taken in a wide sense we may understand also external sensible actions which are to the sacrament what water is to baptism or chrism to confirmation but it is to be observed that in those sacraments whereby an exceptional grace surpassing altogether the proportion of a human act is conferred some corporeal matter is employed externally for example in baptism which confers full remission of all sins both as to guilt and as to punishment and in confirmation 
wherein the fullness of the Holy Ghost is bestowed, and in extreme unction, which confers perfect spiritual health derived from the virtue of Christ as from an extrinsic principle. Wherefore, such human acts as are in these sacraments are not the essential matter of the sacrament, but are dispositions thereto. On the other hand, in those sacraments whose effect corresponds to that of some human act, the sensible human act itself takes the place of matter, as in the case of penance and matrimony, even as in bodily medicines some are applied externally, such as plasters and drugs, while others are acts of the person who seeks to be cured, such as certain exercises. Reply to Objection 2 in those sacraments which have a corporeal matter, this matter needs to be applied by a minister of the church who stands in the place of Christ, which denotes that the excellence of the power which operates in the sacraments is from Christ. But in the sacrament of penance, as stated above in the first reply, human actions take the place of matter, and these actions proceed from internal inspiration, wherefore the matter is not applied by the minister, but by God working inwardly while the minister furnishes the complement of the sacrament when he absolves the penitent. Reply to Objection 3 In penance also, there is something which is sacrament only, namely the acts performed outwardly both by the repentant sinner and by the priest in giving absolution. That which is reality and sacrament is the sinner's inward repentance, while that which is reality and not sacrament is the forgiveness of sin. The first of these taken altogether is the cause of the second, and the first and the second together are the cause of the third. Second article. Whether sins are the proper matter of this sacrament. Objection 1. It would seem that sins are not the proper matter of this sacrament, because in the other sacraments the matter is hallowed by the utterance of certain words, being thus hallowed produces the sacramental effect. Now sins cannot be hallowed, for they are opposed to the effect of the sacrament, namely grace which blots out sin. Therefore, sins are not the proper matter of the sacrament. Objection to further. Augustine says in his book on penance, no one can begin a new life unless he repent of the old. Now not only sins, but also the penalties of the present life belong to the old life. Therefore, sins are not the proper matter of penance. Objection 3. Further, sin is either original, mortal, or venial. Now the sacrament of penance is not ordained against original sin, for this is taken away by baptism nor against venial sin, which is taken away by the beating of the breast and the sprinkling of holy water and the like. Therefore, sins are not the proper matter of penance. On the contrary, the Apostle says in Second Corinthians 12, verse 21, Who have not done penance for the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness that they have committed. I answer that, Matter is twofold, namely, proximate and remote. Thus the proximate matter of a statue is a metal, while the remote matter is water. Now it has been stated in Article 1, first and second replies, that the proximate matter of this sacrament consists in the acts of the penitent, the matter of which acts are the sins over which he grieves, which he confesses, and for which he satisfies. Hence it follows that sins are the remote matter of penance, as a matter, not for approval, but for detestation and destruction. Reply to Objection 1 This argument considers the proximate matter of a sacrament. Reply to Objection 2 The old life that was subject to death is the object of penance not as regards the punishment, but as regards the guilt connected with it. 
Reply to Objection 3. Penance regards every kind of sin in a way, but not each in the same way. Because penance regards actual mortal sin properly and chiefly, properly, since, properly speaking, we are said to repent of what we have done of our own will. Chiefly, since this sacrament was instituted chiefly for the blotting out of mortal sin. Penance regards venial sins, properly speaking, indeed, in so far as they are committed of our own will, but this was not the chief purpose of its institution. But as to original sin, penance regards it neither chiefly, since baptism, and not penance, is ordained against original sin, not properly, because original sin is not done of our own will, except in so far as Adam's will is looked upon as ours, in which sense the Apostle says in Romans 5.12, In whom all have sinned. Nevertheless, penance may be said to regard original sin, if we take it in a wide sense for any detestation of something past, in which sense Augustine uses the term in his book on penance. Third article. Whether the form of this sacrament is I absolve thee. Objection 1. It would seem that the form of the sacrament is not, I absolve thee, because the forms of the sacraments are received from Christ's institution and the Church's custom. But we do not read that Christ instituted this form, nor is it in common use. In fact, in certain absolutions which are given publicly in a Church, for example, at Prime and Compline and on Monday, Thursday, Absolution is not given in the indicative form by saying, I absolve thee, but in the deprecatory form by saying, May Almighty God have mercy on you, or May Almighty God grant you absolution and forgiveness. Therefore, the form of this sacrament is not, I absolve thee. Objection to further. Pope Leo says in his letter 108, that God's forgiveness cannot be obtained without the priestly supplications, and he is speaking there of God's forgiveness granted to the penitent. Therefore, the form of the sacrament should be deprecatory. Objection 3 further. To absolve from sin is the same as to remit sin. But God alone remits sin, for he alone cleanses man inwardly from sin, as Augustine says, against the Donatists, 521. Therefore it seems that God alone absolves from sin. Therefore the priest should not say, I absolve thee, as neither does he say, I remit thy sins. Objection 4. Further, just as our Lord gave his disciples the power to absolve from sins, so also did he give them the power to heal infirmities to cast out devils, and to cure diseases, according to Matthew 10.1 and Luke 9.1. Now the apostles in healing the sick did not use the words, I heal thee, but the Lord Jesus Christ heal thee, as Peter said to the palsied man in Acts 9.34. Therefore, since priests have the power which Christ gave to his apostles, it seems that they should not use the form, I absolve thee, but may Christ absolve thee. Objection 5. Further, some explain this form by stating that when they say, I absolve thee, they mean, I declare to you to be absolved. But neither can this be done by a priest unless it be revealed to him by God. Wherefore, as we read in Matthew 16.19, before it was said to Peter, Whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, etc., it was said to him in Matthew 16:17, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood have not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Therefore it seems presumptuous for a priest, who has neither no revelation on the matter to say, I absolve thee, even if this be explained to mean, I declare thee absolved. On the contrary, as our Lord said to his disciples in Matthew 28, verse 19, going, 
teach ye all nations baptizing them etc so did he say to peter in matthew sixteen verse nineteen whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth etc now the priest relying on the authority of those words of christ says i baptize thee therefore on the same authority he should say in this sacrament i absolve thee i answer that the perfection of a thing is ascribed to its form now it has been stated above in article one second reply that this sacrament is perfected by that which is done by the priest wherefore the part taken by the penitent whether it consist of words or deeds must needs be the matter of this sacrament while the part taken by the priest takes the place of the form now since the sacraments of the new law accomplish what they signify as stated above in question sixty two article one first reply it behooves the sacramental form to signify the sacramental effect in a manner that is in keeping with the matter hence the form of baptism is i baptize thee and the form of confirmation is i sign thee with the sign of the cross and i confirm thee with the chrism of salvation because these sacraments are perfected in the use of their matter while in the sacrament of the eucharist which consists in the very consecration of the matter the reality of the consecration is expressed in the words this is my body now this sacrament namely the sacrament of penance consists not in the consecration of a matter nor in the use of a hallowed matter but rather in the removal of a certain matter namely sin in so far as sins are said to be the matter of penance as explained above in article two this removal is expressed by the priest saying i absolve thee because sins are fetters according to proverbs five twenty two his own iniquities catch the wicked and he is fast bound with the ropes of his own sins wherefore it is evident that this is the most fitting form of the sacrament i absolve thee reply to objection one this form is taken from christ's very words which he addressed to peter in matthew sixteen verse nineteen whatsoever shalt thou loose on earth etc and such is the form employed by the church in sacramental absolution but such absolutions as are given in public are not sacramental but are prayers for the remission of venial sins wherefore in giving sacramental absolution it would not suffice to say may almighty god have mercy on thee or may god grant thee absolution and forgiveness because by such words the priest does not signify the giving of absolution but prays that it may be given nevertheless the above prayer is said before the sacramental absolution is given lest the sacramental effect be hindered on the part of the penitent whose acts are as a matter in the sacrament but not in baptism or confirmation reply to objection to the words of leo are to be understood of the prayer that precedes the absolution and do not exclude the fact that the priest pronounces the absolution reply to objection three god alone absolves from sin and forgives sins authoritatively yet priests do both ministerially because the words of the priest in this sacrament work as instruments of the divine power as in the other sacraments because it is the divine power that works inwardly in all the sacramental signs be they things or words as shown above in question sixty two article four as well as in question sixty four articles one and two wherefore our lord expressed both for he said to peter in matthew sixteen verse nineteen whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth etc and to his disciples in john twenty verse twenty three whose sins you shall forgive they are forgiven them yet the priest says i absolve thee rather than i forgive thee thy sins because it is more in keeping with the words of our lord by expressing the power of the keys whereby priests absolve 
Nevertheless, since the priest absolves ministerially, something is suitably added in reference to the supreme authority of God by the priest saying, I absolve thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, or by the power of Christ's passion, or by the authority of God. However, as this is not defined by the words of Christ, as it is for baptism, this addition is left to the discretion of the priest. Reply to Objection 4 Power was given to the apostles, not that they themselves might heal the sick, but that the sick might be healed at the prayer of the apostles, whereas power was given them to work instrumentally or ministerially in the sacraments. Wherefore, they could express their own agency in the sacramental forms rather than in the healing of infirmities. Nevertheless, in the latter case, they did not always use the deprecatory form, but sometimes employed the indicative or imperative. Thus we read in Acts 3, verse 6, that Peter said to the lame man, What I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. Reply to Objection 5 It is true, in a sense, that the words, I absolve thee, mean, I declare thee absolved. But this explanation is incomplete, because the sacraments of the new law not only signify, but affect what they signify. Wherefore, just as the priest in baptizing anyone declares by deed and word that the person is washed inwardly, and this not only significatively, but also effectively, so also when he says, I absolve thee, he declares the man to be absolved, not only significatively, but also effectively. And yet he does not speak as of something uncertain, because just as the other sacraments of the new law have, of themselves, a sure effect through the power of Christ's passion, which effect, nevertheless, be impeded on the part of the recipient, so is it with this sacrament. Hence Augustine says, There is nothing disgraceful or onerous in the reconciliation of husband and wife, when adultery committed has been washed away, since there is no doubt that remission of sins is granted through the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Consequently, there is no need for a special revelation to be made to the priest, but the general revelation of faith suffices, through which sins are forgiven. Hence the revelation of faith is said to have been made to Peter. It would be a more complete explanation to say that the words, I absolve thee, mean, I grant thee the sacrament of absolution. Fourth article. Whether the imposition of the priest's hands is necessary for the sacrament. Objection 1. It would seem that the imposition of the priest's hands is necessary for the sacrament, for it is written in Mark 16, verse 18, They shall lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. Now sinners are sick, spiritually, and obtain recovery through this sacrament. Therefore an imposition of hands should be made in this sacrament. Objection to further. In this sacrament, man regains the Holy Ghost whom he had lost. Wherefore it is said in the person of the penitent, in Psalm 1, verse 14, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and strengthen me with a perfect spirit. Now the Holy Ghost is given by the imposition of hands, for we read in Acts 8, verse 17, that the apostles laid their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And in Matthew 19, verse 13, that little children were presented to our Lord, that he should impose hands upon them. Therefore, an imposition of hands should be made in this sacrament. Objection 3 further. The priest's words are not more efficacious in this than in the other sacraments. But in the other sacraments, the words of the minister do not suffice, unless he perform some action. Thus in baptism, the priest, while saying, I baptize thee, has to perform a bodily washing. Therefore, also while saying, I absolve thee, the priest should perform some action in regard to the penitent by laying hands on him. On the contrary, 
when our Lord said to Peter, in Matthew 16, verse 19, Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, etc., he made no mention of an imposition of hands. Nor did he, when he said to all of the apostles in John 20, verse 13, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Therefore, no imposition of hands is required for this sacrament. I answer that, in the sacraments of the church, the imposition of hands is made to signify some abundant effect of grace, through those on whom the hands are laid being, as it were, united to the ministers in whom grace should be plentiful. Wherefore, an imposition of hands is made in the sacrament of confirmation, wherein the fullness of the Holy Ghost is conferred, and in the sacrament of order, wherein is bestowed a certain excellence of power over the divine mysteries. Hence it is written in Second Timothy 1 6, Stir up the grace of God which is in thee by the imposition of my hands. Now the sacrament of penance is ordained not that man may receive some abundance of grace, but that his sins may be taken away, and therefore no imposition of hands is required for the sacrament, as neither is there for baptism, wherein nevertheless a fuller remission of sins is bestowed. Reply to Objection 1. That imposition of hands is not sacramental, but is intended for the working of miracles, namely, that by the contact of a sanctified man's hand, even bodily infirmity might be removed, even as we read of our Lord in Mark 6, verse 5, that he cured the sick by laying his hands upon them, and in Matthew 8, verse 3, that he cleansed a leper by touching him. Reply to Objection 2. It is not every reception of the Holy Ghost that requires an imposition of hands, since even in baptism man receives the Holy Ghost without any imposition of hands. It is at the reception of the fullness of the Holy Ghost which belongs to confirmation that an imposition of hands is required. Reply to Objection 3. In those sacraments which are perfected in the use of the matter, the minister has to perform some bodily action on the recipient of the sacrament, for example in baptism, confirmation, and extreme unction, whereas this sacrament does not consist in the use of matter employed outwardly, the matter being supplied by the part taken by the penitent. Wherefore, just as in the Eucharist the priest perfects the sacrament by merely pronouncing the words over the matter, so the mere words which the priest, while absolving, pronounces over the penitent, perfect the sacrament of absolution. If, indeed, any bodily act were necessary on the part of the priest, the sign of the cross which is employed in the Eucharist would not be less becoming than the imposition of hands, in token that sins are forgiven through the blood of Christ crucified. And yet this is not essential to the sacrament as neither is it to the Eucharist. Fifth Article Whether this sacrament is necessary for salvation? Objection 1. It would seem that this sacrament is not necessary for salvation, because on Psalm 125, verse 5, that they sow in tears, etc., the gloss says, Be not sorrowful, if thou hast a good will of which peace is the need. But sorrow is essential to penance, according to Second Corinthians 7.10, the sorrow that is according to God worketh penance steadfast unto salvation. Therefore a good will without penance suffices for salvation. Objection to further. It is written in Proverbs 10 verse 12, Charity covereth all sins and further on in Proverbs 15, verse 27, by mercy and faith sins are purged away. But this sacrament is for nothing else but the purging of sins. Therefore, if one has charity, faith, and mercy, one can obtain salvation without the sacrament of penance. Objection 3 further. The sacraments of the Church take their origin from the institution of Christ. But according to John 8, Christ absolved the adulterous woman without penance. Therefore, it seems that penance is not necessary for salvation. 
On the contrary, our Lord said, in Luke 13, verse 3, Unless you shall do penance, you shall all likewise perish. I answer that. A thing is necessary for salvation in two ways. First, absolutely. Secondly, on a supposition. A thing is absolutely necessary for salvation if no one can obtain salvation without it, as, for example, the grace of Christ and the sacrament of baptism, whereby a man is born again in Christ. The sacrament of penance is necessary on a supposition, for it is necessary not for all, but for those who are in sin. For it is written in the prayer of Manasseh, Thou, Lord God of the righteous, has not appointed repentance to the righteous, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, nor to those who sinned not against thee. But sin, when it is completed, begetteth death, according to James 1, verse 15. Consequently, it is necessary for the sinner's salvation that sin be taken away from him, which cannot be done without the sacrament of penance, wherein the power of Christ's passion operates through the priest's absolution and the acts of the penitent, who cooperates with grace unto the destruction of his sin. For, as Augustine says in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he who created thee without thee will not justify thee without thee. Therefore, it is evident that after sin the sacrament of penance is necessary for salvation, even as bodily medicine after man has contracted a dangerous disease. Reply to Objection 1. This gloss should apparently be understood as referring to the man who has a good will unimpaired by sin, for such a man has no cause for sorrow. But as soon as the good will is forfeited through sin, it cannot be restored without that sorrow whereby a man sorrows for his past sin and which belongs to penance. Reply to Objection 2. As soon as a man falls into sin, charity, faith, and mercy do not deliver him from sin without penance. Because charity demands that a man should grieve for the offense committed against his friend and that he should be anxious to make satisfaction to his friend. Faith requires that he should seek to be justified from his sins through the power of Christ's passion which operates in the sacraments of the church. And well-ordered pity necessitates that man should succor himself by repenting of the pitiful condition into which sin has brought him, according to Proverbs 14, verse 34, Sin maketh nations miserable. Wherefore it is written, in Ecclesiasticus 30, verse 24, Have pity on thy own soul, pleasing God. Reply to Objection 3. It was due to his power of excellence, which he alone had, as stated above in question 64, article 3, that Christ bestowed on the adulterous woman the effect of the sacrament of penance, namely the forgiveness of sins without the sacrament of penance, although not without internal repentance, which he operated in her by grace. End of question 84, part 1. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 84, Part 2 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 84 of the Sacrament of Penance in Ten Articles. Part 2, Articles 6 through 10. Sixth Article. Whether Penance is a Second Plank After Shipwreck. Objection 1. It would seem that penance is not a second plank after shipwreck. Because on Isaiah 3 verse 19, they have proclaimed abroad their sin as Sodom. A gloss says, The second plank after shipwreck is to hide one's sins. No penance does not hide sins but reveals them. Therefore, penance is not the second plank. Objection to further. 
in a building the foundation takes the first not the second place now in the spiritual edifice penance is the foundation according to hebrews 6 verse 1 not laying again the foundation of penance from dead works wherefore it precedes even baptism according to acts 2 verse 38 do penance and be baptized every one of you therefore penance should not be called a second plank objection three further all the sacraments are planks that is helps against sin now penance holds not the second but the fourth place among the sacraments as is clear from what has been said above in question sixty five articles one and two therefore penance should not be called a second plank after shipwreck on the contrary jerome says in his letter one hundred and thirty that penance is a second plank after shipwreck i answer that that which is of itself precedes naturally that which is accidental as substance precedes accident now some sacraments are of themselves ordained to man's salvation for example baptism which is the spiritual birth confirmation which is the spiritual growth the eucharist which is the spiritual food whereas penance is ordained to man's salvation accidentally as it were and on something being supposed namely sin for unless man were to sin actually he would not stand in need of penance and yet he would need baptism confirmation and the eucharist even as in the life of the body man would need no medical treatment unless he were ill and yet life birth growth and food are of themselves necessary to man consequently penance holds the second place with regard to the state of integrity which is bestowed and safeguarded by the aforesaid sacraments so that it is called metaphorically a second plank after shipwreck for just as the first help for those who cross the sea is to be safeguarded in a whole ship while the second help when the ship is wrecked is to cling to a plank so too the first help in this life's ocean is that man safeguard his integrity while the second help is if he lose his integrity through sin that he regain it by means of penance reply to objection one to hide one's sins may happen in two ways first in the very act of sinning now it is worse to sin in public than in private both because a public sinner seems to sin more from contempt and because by sinning he gives scandal to others consequently in sin it is a kind of remedy to sin secretly and it is in this sense that the gloss says that to hide one's sins is a second plank after shipwreck not that it takes away sin as penance does but because it makes the sin less grievous secondly one hides one's sin previously committed by neglecting to confess it this is opposed to penance and to hide one's sin thus is not a second plank but is the reverse since it is written in proverbs 28 verse 13 he that hideth his sins shall not prosper reply to objection to penance cannot be called the foundation of the spiritual edifice simply that is in the first building thereof but it is the foundation in the second building which is accomplished by destroying sin because man on his return to god needs penance first however the apostle is speaking there of the foundation of spiritual doctrine moreover the penance which precedes baptism is not the sacrament of penance reply to objection three the three sacraments which precede penance refer to the ship in its integrity that is to man's state of integrity with regard to which penance is called a second plank seventh article whether this sacrament was suitably instituted in the new law objection one it would seem that this sacrament was unsuitably instituted in the new law because those things which belong to the natural law 
need not to be instituted. Now it belongs to the natural law that one should repent of the evil one has done, for it is impossible to love good without grieving for its contrary. Therefore penance was unsuitably instituted in the new law. Objection to further. That which existed in the old law had not to be instituted in the new. Now there was penance in the old law, wherefore the Lord complains in Jeremiah 8, verse 6, saying, There is none that doth penance for his sin, saying, What have I done? Therefore penance should not have been instituted in the new law. Objection 3 further. Penance comes after baptism, since it is a second plank as stated above in Article 6. Now it seems that our Lord instituted penance before baptism, because we read that at the beginning of his preaching he said in Matthew 4, verse 17, Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Therefore, this sacrament was not suitably instituted in the new law. Objection 4 further. The sacraments of the new law were instituted by Christ, by whose power they work, as stated above in question 62, article 5, as well as in question 64, article 1. But Christ does not seem to have instituted this sacrament, since he made no use of it, as of the other sacraments which he instituted. Therefore, this sacrament was unsuitably instituted in the new law. On the contrary, our Lord said, in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47, It behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise again from the dead the third day, and that penance and remission of sins should be preached in his name unto all nations. I answer that, as stated above in Article 1, First Reply and Second Reply. In the sacrament, the acts of the penitent are as matter, while the part taken by the priest, who works as Christ's minister, is the formal and completive element of the sacrament. Now in the other sacraments the matter pre-exists, being provided by nature, as water, or by art, as bread. But that such and such a matter be employed for a sacrament requires to be decided by the institution. While the sacrament derives its form and power entirely from the institution of Christ, from whose passion the power of the sacraments proceeds. Accordingly, the matter of this sacrament pre-exists, being provided by nature, since it is by a natural principle of reason that man is moved to repent of the evil he has done. Yet it is due to divine institution that man does penance in this or that way. Wherefore, at the outset of his preaching, our Lord admonished men not only to repent, but also to do penance, thus pointing to the particular manner of actions required for the sacrament. As to the part to be taken by the ministers, this was fixed by our Lord when he said to Peter, in Matthew 16, verse 19, To thee will I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, etc. But it was after his resurrection that he made known the efficacy of the sacrament and the source of its power when he said in Luke 24, verse 47, that penance and remission of sin should be preached in his name unto all nations, after speaking of his passion and resurrection. Because it is from the power of the name of Jesus Christ suffering and rising again that this sacrament is efficacious unto the remission of sins. It is therefore evident that this sacrament was suitably instituted in the new law. Reply to Objection 1. It is a natural law that one should repent of the evil one has done, by grieving for having done it, and by seeking a remedy for one's grief in some way or another, and also that one should show some signs of grief, even as the Ninevites did, as we read in John 3. And yet even in their case there was also something of faith which they had received through Jonah's preaching, inasmuch as they did these things in the hope that they would receive pardon from God, according as we read in John 3, verse 9, Who can tell if God will turn and forgive, or will turn away from his fierce anger, and we shall not perish? But just as other matters which are of 
the natural law were fixed in detail by the institution of the divine law, as we have stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secundi, question 91, article 4, as well as in question 95, article 2, and in question 99. So was it with penance. Reply to Objection 2. Things which are of the natural law were determined in various ways in the old and in the new law, in keeping with the imperfection of the old and the perfection of the new. Wherefore penance was fixed in a certain way in the old law, with regard to sorrow, that it should be in the heart rather than in external things, according to Joel 2, verse 13, Rend your hearts and not your garments. And with regard to seeking a remedy for sorrow, that they should in some way confess their sins, at least in general, to God's ministers. Wherefore the Lord said, in Leviticus 5, verses 17 and 18, If any one sin through ignorance, he shall offer of the flocks a ram without blemish to the priest, according to the measure and estimation of the sin, and the priest shall pray for him, because he did it ignorantly, and it shall be forgiven him. Since by the very fact of making an offering for his sin, a man, in a fashion, confessed his sin to the priest. And accordingly it is written in Proverbs 28, verse 13, He that hideth his sins shall not prosper, but he that shall confess and forsake them shall obtain mercy. Not yet, however, was the power of the keys instituted, which is derived from Christ's passion, and consequently it was not yet ordained that a man should grieve for his own sin with the purpose of submitting himself by confession and satisfaction to the keys of the church, in the hope of receiving forgiveness through the power of Christ's passion. Reply to Objection 3 If we note carefully what our Lord said about the necessity of baptism, in John chapter 3, verse 3 and following, we shall see that this was said before his words about the necessity of penance, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, because he spoke to Nicodemus about baptism before the imprisonment of John, of whom it is related afterwards, in John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, that he baptized, whereas his words about penance were said after John was cast into prison. If, however, he had admonished men to do penance before admonishing them to be baptized, this would be because also before baptism some kind of penance is required, according to the words of Peter in Acts 2, verse 38. Do penance, and be baptized every one of you. Reply to Objection 4 Christ did not use the baptism which he instituted, but was baptized with the baptism of John, as stated above, in Question 39, Articles 1 and 2. Nor did he use it actively by administering it to himself, because he did not baptize as a rule, but his disciples did, as is related in John chapter 4, verse 2, although it is to be believed that he baptized his disciples, as Augustine asserts. But with regard to his institution of this sacrament, it was no wise fitting that he should use it, neither by repenting himself, in whom there was no sin, nor by administering the sacrament to others, since, in order to show his mercy and power, he was wont to confer the effect of this sacrament without the sacrament itself, as stated above in Article 5, Third Reply. On the other hand, he both received and gave to others the sacrament of the Eucharist, both in order to commend the excellence of that sacrament, and because that sacrament is a memorial of his passion in which Christ is both priest and victim. Eighth Article Whether Penance Should Last Till the End of Life Objection 1. It would seem that penance should not last till the end of life, because penance is ordained for the blotting out of sin. Now the penitent receives forgiveness of his sin at once, according to Ezekiel 18, verse 21. If the wicked do penance for all his sins which he hath committed, he shall live and shall not die. Therefore, there is no need for penance to be further prolonged. Objection to further. Penance belongs to the state of beginners, but man ought to advance from that state to the state of the proficient, and from this 
to the state of the perfect. Therefore, man need not to do penance till the end of his life. Objection 3 further. Man is bound to observe the laws of the church in this as in the other sacraments. But the duration of repentance is fixed by the canons so that, to wit, for such and such a sin one is bound to do penance for so many years. Therefore it seems that penance should not be prolonged till the end of life. On the contrary, Augustine says in his book on penance, what remains for us to do save to sorrow ever in this life? For when sorrow ceases, repentance fails, and if repentance fails, what becomes of pardon? I answer that penance is twofold, internal and external. Internal penance is that whereby one grieves for a sin which one has committed, and this penance should last until the end of life, because man should always be displeased at having sinned, for if he were to be pleased thereat, he would for this very reason fall into sin and lose the fruit of pardon. Now displeasure causes sorrow in one who is susceptible to sorrow, as man is in this life. But after this life the saints are not susceptible to sorrow, wherefore they will be displeased at, without sorrowing for, their past sins, according to Isaiah 65, verse 16, the former distresses are not forgotten. External penance is that whereby a man shows external signs of sorrow, confesses his sins verbally to the priest who absolves him, and makes satisfaction for his sins according to the judgment of the priest. Such penance need not last until the end of life, but only for a fixed time according to the measure of the sin. Reply to Objection 1. True penance not only removes past sins, but also preserves man from future sins. Consequently, although a man receives forgiveness of past sins in the first instant of his true penance, nevertheless he must persevere in his penance, lest he fall again into sin. Reply to Objection 2. To do penance both internal and external belongs to the state of beginners, of those to wit who are making a fresh start from the state of sin. But there is room for internal penance, even in the proficient and the perfect, according to Psalm 83, verse 7. In his heart he hath disposed to ascend by steps in the veil of tears. Wherefore Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Reply to Objection 3. These durations of time are fixed for penitence as regards the exercise of external penance. Ninth Article. Whether Penance Can Be Continuous. Objection 1. It would seem that penance cannot be continuous. For it is written in Jeremiah 31 verse 16, let thy voice cease from weeping, and thy eyes from tears. But this would be impossible if penance were continuous, for it consists in weeping and tears. Therefore, penance cannot be continuous. Objection to further. Man ought to rejoice at every good work, according to Psalm 99, verse 1. Serve ye the Lord with gladness. Now to do penance is a good work. Therefore man should rejoice at it. But man cannot rejoice and grieve at the same time, as the philosopher declares in Ethics 9.4. Therefore a penitent cannot grieve continually for his past sins, which is essential to penance. Therefore penance cannot be continuous. Objection 3 further. The Apostle says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Comfort him, namely the penitent, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. But comfort dispels grief, which is essential to penance. Therefore, penance need not be continuous. On the contrary, Augustine says in his book on penance, in doing penance, grief should be continual. 
I answer that, one is said to repent in two ways, actually and habitually. It is impossible for a man continually to repent actually, for the acts, whether internal or external, of a penitent, must needs be interrupted by sleep and other things which the body needs. Secondly, a man is said to repent habitually, and thus he should repent continually, both by never doing anything contrary to penance, so as to destroy the habitual disposition of the penitent, and by being resolved that his past sins should always be displeasing to him. Reply to Objection 1 weeping and tears belong to the act of external penance and this act needs neither to be continuous nor to last until the end of life as stated above in article eight wherefore it is significantly added for there is a reward for thy work now the reward of the penitent's work is the full remission of sin both as to guilt and as to punishment and after receiving this reward, there is no need for man to proceed to acts of external penance. This, however, does not prevent penance being continual, as explained above. Reply to Objection 2. Of sorrow and joy, we may speak in two ways. First, as being passions of the sensitive appetite, and thus they can nowise be together, since they are altogether contrary to one another, either on the part of the object, as when they have the same object, or at least on the part of the movement, for joy is with expansion of the heart, whereas sorrow is with contraction. And it is in this sense that the philosopher speaks in Ethics 9. Secondly, we may speak of joy and sorrow as being simple acts of the will to which something is pleasing or displeasing. Accordingly, they cannot be contrary to one another except on the part of the object, as when they concern the same object in the same respect, in which way joy and sorrow cannot be simultaneous, because the same thing in the same respect cannot be pleasing and displeasing. If, on the other hand, joy and sorrow, understood thus, be not of the same object in the same respect, but either of different objects or of the same object in different respects, in that case, joy and sorrow are not contrary to one another, so that nothing hinders a man from being joyful and sorrowful at the same time. For instance, if we see a good man suffer, we both rejoice at his goodness and at the same time grieve for his suffering. In this way, a man may be displeased at having sinned, and be pleased at his displeasure together with his hope for pardon, so that his very sorrow is a matter of joy. Hence Augustine says, The penitent should ever grieve and rejoice at his grief. If, however, sorrow were altogether incompatible with joy, this would prevent the continuance not of habitual penance, but only of actual penance. Reply to Objection 3 According to the philosopher in Ethics 2, chapters 3, 6, 7, and 9, it belongs to virtue to establish the mean in the passions. Now the sorrow which, in the sensitive appetite of the penitent, arises from the displeasure of his will, is a passion. Wherefore it should be moderated according to virtue. And if it be excessive, it is sinful, because it leads to despair, as the Apostle teaches in Second Corinthians 2 Corinthians 2.7, saying, Lest such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Accordingly, comfort, of which the Apostle speaks, moderates sorrow, but does not destroy it altogether. Tenth Article Whether the Sacrament of Penance May Be Repeated Objection 1. It would seem that the Sacrament of Penance should not be repeated. For the Apostle says in Hebrews 6, verse 4 and following, It is impossible for those who were once illuminated, have tasted also the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and are fallen away to be renewed again to penance. Now whosoever have done penance have been illuminated, and have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, 
whosoever sin after doing penance cannot do penance again objection to further ambrose says in on penance too some are to be found who think that they ought often to do penance who take liberties with christ for if they were truly penitent they would not think of doing penance over again since there is but one penance even as there is but one baptism now baptism is not repeated neither therefore is penance to be repeated objection three further the miracles whereby our lord healed bodily diseases signify the healing of spiritual diseases whereby men are delivered from sins now we do not read that our lord restored the sight to any blind man twice or that he cleansed any leper twice or twice raised any dead man to life therefore it seems that he does not twice grant pardon to any sinner objection for further gregory says in a homily penance consists in deploring past sins and in not committing again those we have deplored and isidore says in on the supreme good too he is a mocker and no penitent who still does what he has repented of if therefore a man is truly penitent he will not sin again therefore penance cannot be repeated objection five further just as baptism derives its efficacy from the passion of christ so does penance now baptism is not repeated on account of the unity of christ's passion and death therefore in like manner penance is not repeated objection six further ambrose says on psalm 118 verse 58 i entreated thy face etc that facility of obtaining pardon is an incentive to sin if therefore god frequently grants pardon through penance it seems that he affords man an incentive to sin and thus he seems to take pleasure in sin which is contrary to his goodness therefore penance cannot be repeated on the contrary man is induced to be merciful by the example of divine mercy according to luke six verse thirty six be ye merciful as your father also is merciful now our lord commanded his disciples to be merciful by frequently pardoning their brethren who had sinned against them wherefore as he related in matthew eighteen verse twenty one when peter asked how often shall my brother off end against me and i forgive him till seven times jesus answered i say not to thee till seven times but till seventy times seven times therefore also god over and over again through penance grants pardon to sinners especially as he teaches us to pray in matthew six verse twelve forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us i answer that as regards penance some have erred saying that a man cannot obtain pardon of his sins through penance a second time some of these namely the novations went so far as to say that he who sins after the first penance which is done in baptism cannot be restored again through penance there were also other heretics who as augustine relates in on penance said that after baptism penance is useful not many times but only once these errors seem to have arisen from a twofold source first from not knowing the nature of true penance for since true penance requires charity without which sins are not taken away they thought that charity once possessed could not be lost and that consequently penance if true could never be removed by sin so that it should be necessary to repeat it but this was refuted in the second part question twenty four article eleven where it was shown that on account of free will charity once possessed can be lost and that consequently after true penance man can sin mortally secondly they erred in their estimation of the gravity of sin 
for they deemed a sin committed by a man after he had received pardon to be so grave that it could not be forgiven in this they erred not only with regard to sin which even after a sin has been forgiven can be either more or less grievous than the first which was forgiven but much more did they err against the infinity of divine mercy which surpasses any number and magnitude of sins according to psalm fifty verses one and two have mercy on me o god according to thy great mercy and according to the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my iniquity wherefore the words of cain were reprehensible when he said in genesis four verse thirteen my iniquity is greater than i may deserve pardon and so god's mercy through penance grants pardon to sinners without any end wherefore it is written again in the prayer of manassas thy merciful promise is unmeasured and unsearchable and thou repentest for the evil brought upon man it is therefore evident that penance can be repeated many times reply to objection one some of the jews thought that a man could be washed several times in the laver of baptism because among them the law prescribed certain washing places where they were wont to cleanse themselves repeatedly from their uncleanness in order to disprove this the apostle wrote to the hebrews that it is impossible for those who were once illuminated namely through baptism to be renewed again to penance namely through baptism which is the laver of regeneration and renovation of the holy ghost as stated in titus three five and he declares the reason to be that by baptism man dies with christ wherefore he adds in hebrews six six crucifying again to themselves the son of god reply to objection to ambrose is speaking of solemn penance which is not repeated in the church as we shall state further on in the supplementum question twenty eight article two reply to objection three as augustine says our lord gave sight to many blind men at various times and strength to many infirm thereby showing in these different men that the same sins are repeatedly forgiven and at one time healing a man from leprosy and afterwards from blindness for this reason he healed so many stricken with fever and so many feeble in body so many lame blind and withered that the sinner might not despair for this reason he is not described as healing any one but once that every one might fear to link himself with sin for this reason he declares himself to be the physician welcomed not of the hale but of the unhealthy what sort of a physician is he who knows not how to heal a recurring disease for if a man ail a hundred times it is for the physician to heal him a hundred times and if he failed where others succeed he would be a poor physician in comparison with him reply to objection four penance is to deplore past sins and while deploring them not to commit again either by act or by intention those which we have to deplore because a man is a mocker and not a penitent who while doing penance does what he repents having done or intends to do again what he did before or even commits actually the same or another kind of sin but if a man sin afterwards either by act or intention this does not destroy the fact that his former penance was real because the reality of the former act is never destroyed by a subsequent contrary act for even as he truly ran who afterwards sits so he truly repented who subsequently sins reply to objection five baptism derives its power from christ's passion as a spiritual regeneration with a spiritual death of a previous life now it is appointed unto man once to die according to hebrews nine verse twenty seven and to be born once wherefore man should be baptized but once on the other hand 
penance derives its power from christ's passion as a spiritual medicine which can be repeated frequently reply to objection six according to augustine it is evident that sins displease god exceedingly for he is always ready to destroy them lest what he created should perish and what he loved be lost namely by despair End of question 84. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 85. Of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 85. Of Penance as a Virtue. In Six Articles. We must now consider penance as a virtue, under which head there are six points of inquiry. First, whether penance is a virtue. Second, whether it is a special virtue. Third, to what species of virtue does it belong? fourth of its subject fifth of its cause sixth of its relation to the other virtues first article whether penance is a virtue objection one it would seem that penance is not a virtue for penance is a sacrament numbered among the other sacraments as was shown above in question eighty four article one and in question sixty five article one now no other sacrament is a virtue therefore neither is penance a virtue objection to further according to the philosopher in ethics four nine shame is not a virtue both because it is a passion accompanied by a bodily alteration and because it is not the disposition of a perfect thing since it is about an evil act, so that it has no place in a virtuous man. Now in like manner, penance is a passion accompanied by a bodily alteration, namely tears, according to Gregory, who says in a homily that penance consists in deploring past sins. Moreover, it is about evil deeds, namely sins, which have no place in a virtuous man. Therefore, Penance is not a virtue. Objection 3 further. According to the philosopher in Ethics 4.3, no virtuous man is foolish. But it seems foolish to deplore what has been done in the past, since it cannot be otherwise, and yet this is what we understand by penance. Therefore, penance is not a virtue. On the contrary, the precepts of the law are about acts of virtue because a lawgiver intends to make the citizens virtuous according to ethics two one but there is a precept about penance in the divine law according to matthew four verse seventeen do penance etc therefore penance is a virtue i answer that as stated above in objection two and in question eighty four article ten fourth reply to repent is to deplore something one has done now it has been stated above in question eighty four article nine that sorrow or sadness is twofold first it denotes a passion of the sensitive appetite and in this sense penance is not a virtue but a passion secondly it denotes an act of the will and in this way it implies choice and if this be right it must of necessity be an act of virtue for it is stated in ethics two six that virtue is a habit of choosing according to right reason now it belongs to right reason that one should grieve for a proper object of grief as one ought to grieve and for an end for which one ought to grieve and this is observed in the penance of which we are now speaking since the penitent assumes a moderated grief for his past sins with the intention of removing them hence it is evident 
that the penance of which we are speaking now is either a virtue or the act of a virtue. Reply to Objection 1 As stated above in question 84, article 1, first reply, as well as in articles 2 and 3, in the sacrament of penance, human acts take the place of matter, which is not the case in baptism and confirmation. Wherefore, since virtue is a principle of an act, penance is either a virtue or accompanies a virtue, rather than baptism or confirmation. Reply to Objection 2 Penance, considered as a passion, is not a virtue, as stated above, and it is thus that it is accompanied by a bodily alteration. On the other hand, it is a virtue, according as it includes a right choice on the part of the will, which, however, applies to penance rather than to shame. Because shame regards the evil deed as present, whereas penance regards the evil deed as past. Now it is contrary to the perfection of virtue that one should have an evil deed actually present, of which one ought to be ashamed. Whereas it is not contrary to the perfection of virtue that we should have previously committed evil deeds, of which it behooves us to repent, since a man from being wicked becomes virtuous. Reply to Objection 3 it would indeed be foolish to grieve for what has already been done with the intention of trying to make it not done. But the penitent does not intend this, for his sorrow is displeasure or disapproval with regard to the past deed with the intention of removing its result, namely, the anger of God and the debt of punishment, and this is not foolish. Second Article whether penance is a special virtue. Objection 1. It would seem that penance is not a special virtue. For it seems that to rejoice at the good one has done and to grieve for the evil one has done are acts of the same nature. But joy for the good one has done is not a special virtue but is a praiseworthy emotion proceeding from charity, as Augustine states in On the City of God, 14, chapters 7, 8, and 9. Wherefore the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, that charity rejoiceth not at iniquity, but rejoiceth with the truth. Therefore, in like manner, neither is penance, which is sorrow for past sins, a special virtue, but an emotion resulting from charity. Objection to further. Every special virtue has its special matter, because habits are distinguished by their acts, and acts by their objects. But penance has no special matter, because its matter is past sins in any matter whatever. Therefore, penance is not a special virtue. Objection 3 further. Nothing is removed except by its contrary. But penance removes all sins, Therefore, it is contrary to all sins, and consequently is not a special virtue. On the contrary, the law has a special precept about penance, as stated above in question 84, articles 5 and 7. I answer that, as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secunde question 54, article 1, first reply, as well as in article 2, habits are specifically distinguished according to the species of their acts, so that whenever an act has a special reason for being praiseworthy, there must needs be a special habit. Now it is evident that there is a special reason for praising the act of penance, because it aims at the destruction of past sin, considered as an offense against God, which does not apply to any other virtue. We must therefore conclude that penance is a special virtue. Reply to Objection 1. An act springs from charity in two ways. First, as being elicited by charity, and a like virtuous act requires no other virtue than charity. For example, to love the good, to rejoice therein, and to grieve for what is opposed to it. 
Secondly, an act springs from charity being, so to speak, commanded by charity. And thus, since charity commands all the virtues, inasmuch as it directs them to its own end, an act springing from charity may belong even to another special virtue. Accordingly, if in the act of the penitent we consider the mere displeasure in the past sin, it belongs to charity immediately, in the same way as joy for past good acts. But the intention to aim at the destruction of past sin requires a special virtue subordinate to charity. Reply to Objection 2. In point of fact, penance has indeed a general matter, inasmuch as it regards all sins. But it does so under a special aspect, inasmuch as they can be remedied by an act of man in cooperating with God for his justification. Reply to Objection 3. Every special virtue removes formally the habit of the opposite vice, just as whiteness removes blackness from the same object. But penance removes every sin effectively, inasmuch as it works for the destruction of sins, according as they are pardonable through the grace of God if man cooperate therewith. Wherefore, it does not follow that it is a general virtue. Third article. Whether the virtue of penance is a species of justice. Objection 1. It would seem that the virtue of penance is not a species of justice. For justice is not a theological, but a moral virtue, as was shown in the second part, in the pars secunda secunde, question 62, article 3. But penance seems to be a theological virtue, since God is its object, for it makes satisfaction to God, to whom, moreover, it reconciles the sinner. Therefore it seems that penance is not a species of justice. Objection to further. Since justice is a moral virtue, it observes the mean. Now penance does not observe the mean, but rather goes to the extreme, according to Jeremiah 6, verse 26. Make thee mourning, as for an only son, a bitter lamentation. Therefore, penance is not a species of justice. Objection 3 further. There are two species of justice as stated in Ethics 5.4, namely, distributive and commutative. But penance does not seem to be contained under either of them. Therefore, it seems that penance is not a species of justice. Objection 4. Further, a gloss on Luke 6, verse 21, Blessed are ye that weep now, says, It is prudence that teaches us the unhappiness of earthly things and the happiness of heavenly things. But weeping is an act of penance. Therefore, penance is a species of prudence rather than of justice. On the contrary, Augustine says in On Penance, Penance is the vengeance of the sorrowful, ever punishing in them what they are sorry for having done. But to take vengeance is an act of justice. Wherefore Tully says, in On the Invention of Rhetoric too, that one kind of justice is called vindictive. Therefore, it seems that penance is a species of justice. I answer that, as stated above in Article 1, Second Reply, penance is a special virtue not merely because it sorrows for evil done, since charity would suffice for that, but also because the penitent grieves for the sin he has committed, inasmuch as it is an offense against God, and purposes to amend. Now amendment for an offense committed against any one is not made by merely ceasing to offend, but it is necessary to make some kind of compensation, which obtains in offenses committed against another, just as retribution does, only that compensation is on the part of the offender, as when he makes satisfaction, whereas retribution is on the part of the person offended against. Each of these belongs to the matter of justice, because each is a kind of commutation. 
Wherefore, it is evident that penance as a virtue is a part of justice. It must be observed, however, that according to the philosopher in Ethics 5.6, a thing is said to be just in two ways, simply and relatively. A thing is just simply when it is between equals, since justice is a kind of equality, and he calls this the politic or civil just, because all citizens are equal, in the point of being immediately under the ruler, retaining their freedom. But a thing is just relatively, when it is between parties of whom one is subject to the other, as a servant under his master, a son under his father, a wife under her husband. It is this kind of just that we consider in penance. Wherefore the penitent has recourse to God with the purpose of amendment as a servant to his master, according to Psalm 122, verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants are on the hands of their masters, so are our eyes unto the Lord our God, until he have mercy on us. And as a son to his father, according to Luke 15, 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And as a wife to her husband, according to Jeremiah 3, verse 1, Thou hast prostituted thyself to many lovers. Nevertheless return to me, saith the Lord. Reply to Objection 1 As stated in Ethics 5, 1, justice is a virtue towards another person, and the matter of justice is not so much the person to whom justice is due as the thing which is the subject of distribution or commutation. Hence the matter of penance is not God, but human acts, whereby God is offended or appeased, whereas God is as one to whom justice is due. Wherefore it is evident that penance is not a theological virtue, because God is not its matter or object. Reply to Objection 2. The mean of justice is the equality that is established between those whom justice is, as stated in Ethics 5. But in certain cases, perfect equality cannot be established, on account of the excellence of one, as between father and son, God and man, as the philosopher states in Ethics 8.14. Wherefore, in such cases, he that falls short of the other must do whatever he can. Yet this will not be sufficient simply, but only according to the acceptance of the higher one, and this is what is meant by ascribing excess to penance. Reply to Objection 3 As there is a kind of commutation in favors, when to wit, a man gives thanks for a favor received, so also is there commutation in the matter of offenses, when, on account of an offense committed against another, a man is either punished against his will, which pertains to vindictive justice, or makes amends of his own accord, which belongs to penance, which regards the person of the sinner, just as vindictive justice regards the person of the judge. Therefore it is evident that both are comprised under commutative justice. Reply to Objection 4. Although penance is directly a species of justice, Yet in a fashion, it comprises things pertaining to all the virtues. For inasmuch as there is a justice of man towards God, it must have a share in matter pertaining to the theological virtues, the object of which is God. Consequently, penance comprises faith in Christ's passion, whereby we are cleaned of our sins, hope for pardon, and hatred of vice, which pertains to charity. Inasmuch as it is a moral virtue, it has a share of prudence, which directs all the moral virtues. But from the very nature of justice, it has not only something belonging to justice, but also something belonging to temperance and fortitude, inasmuch as those things which cause pleasure, and which pertain to temperance, and those which cause terror, which fortitude moderates, are objects of commutative justice. Accordingly, it belongs to justice both to abstain from pleasure, which belongs to temperance, and to bear with hardships, which belongs to fortitude. 
Fourth Article Whether the Will is Properly the Subject of Penance Objection 1. It would seem that the subject of penance is not properly the will. For penance is a species of sorrow. But sorrow is in the concupiscible part, even as joy is. Therefore, penance is in the concupiscible faculty. Objection to further. Penance is a kind of vengeance, as Augustine states in On Penance. But vengeance seems to regard the irascible faculty, since anger is the desire for vengeance. Therefore it seems that penance is in the irascible part. Objection 3 further. The past is the proper object of the memory, according to the philosopher in On Memory 1. Now penance regards the past, as stated above in Article 1, Second Reply. Therefore, penance is subjected in the memory. Objection 4 further. Nothing acts where it is not. Now penance removes sin from all the powers of the soul. Therefore, penance is in every power of the soul, and not only in the will. On the contrary, penance is a kind of sacrifice according to Psalm 50, verse 19. A sacrifice to God is an afflicted spirit. But to offer a sacrifice is an act of the will, according to Psalm 53, verse 8. I will freely sacrifice to thee. Therefore, penance is in the will. I answer that we can speak of penance in two ways. First, in so far as it is a passion, and thus, since it is a kind of sorrow, it is in the concupiscible part as its subject. Secondly, in so far as it is a virtue, and thus, as stated above in Article 3, it is a species of justice. Now justice, as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secundae question 56, Article 6, is subjected in the rational appetite which is the will. Therefore it is evident that penance, in so far as it is a virtue, is subjected in the will, and its proper act is the purpose of amending what was committed against God. Reply to Objection 1. This argument considers penance as a passion. Reply to Objection 2. To desire vengeance on another through passion belongs to the irascible appetite, but to desire or take vengeance on oneself or on another, through reason, belongs to the will. Reply to Objection 3. The memory is a power that apprehends the past. But penance belongs not to the apprehensive, but to the appetitive power, which presupposes an act of the apprehension. Wherefore penance is not in the memory, but presupposes it. Reply to Objection 4. The will, as stated above in the Pars Prima, question 82, article 4, as well as in the Pars Prima Secundi, question 9, article 1, moves all the other powers of the soul, so that it is not unreasonable for penance to be subjected in the will and to produce an effect in each power of the soul. Fifth article. Whether penance originates from fear. Objection 1. It would seem that penance does not originate from fear. For penance originates in displeasure at sin. But this belongs to charity, as stated above in Article 3. Therefore, penance originates from love rather than fear. Objection 2. Further. Men are induced to do penance through the expectation of the heavenly kingdom, according to Matthew 3.2 and Matthew 4.17. Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the kingdom of heaven is the object of hope. Therefore, penance results from hope rather than from fear. Objection 3 further. Fear is an internal act of man. But penance does not seem to arise in us through any work of man but through the operation of God, according to Jeremiah 31.19, 
after thou didst convert me i did penance therefore penance does not result from fear on the contrary it is written in isaiah 26 verse 17 as a woman with child when she draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs so ere we become by penance to wit and according to another version the text continues this time in the septuagint through fear of thee o lord we have conceived and been as it were in labor and have brought forth the spirit of salvation that is of salutary penance as is clear from what precedes therefore penance results from fear i answer that we may speak of penance in two ways first as to the habit and then it is infused by god immediately without our operating as principal agents but not without our cooperating dispositively by certain acts secondly we may speak of penance with regard to the acts whereby in penance we cooperate with god operating the first principle of which acts is the operation of god in turning the heart according to lamentations 521 convert us o lord to thee and we shall be converted the second an act of faith the third a movement of servile fear whereby a man is withdrawn from sin through fear of punishment the fourth a movement of hope whereby a man makes a purpose of amendment in the hope of obtaining pardon the fifth a movement of charity whereby sin is displeasing to man for its own sake and no longer for the sake of the punishment the sixth a movement of filial fear whereby a man of his own accord offers to make amends to god through fear of him accordingly it is evident that the act of penance results from servile fear as from the first movement of the appetite in this direction and from filial fear as from its immediate and proper principle reply to objection one sin begins to displease a man especially a sinner on account of the punishments which servile fear regards before it displeases him on account of its being an offence against god or on account of its wickedness which pertains to charity reply to objection to when the kingdom of heaven is said to be at hand we are to understand that the king is on his way not only to reward but also to punish wherefore john the baptist said in matthew three verse seven ye brood of vipers who hath showed you to flee from the wrath to come reply to objection three even the movement of fear proceeds from god's act in turning the heart wherefore it is written in deuteronomy five twenty nine who shall give them to have such a mind to fear me and so the fact that penance results from fear does not hinder its resulting from the act of god in turning the heart sixth article whether penance is the first of the virtues objection one it would seem that penance is the first of the virtues because on matthew three two do penance etc a gloss says the first virtue is to destroy the old man and hate sin by means of penance objection to further withdrawal from one extreme seems to precede approach to the other now all the other virtues seem to regard approach to a term because they all direct man to do good whereas penance seems to direct him to withdraw from an evil therefore it seems that penance precedes all the other virtues objection three further before penance there is sin in the soul now no virtue is compatible with sin in the soul therefore no virtue precedes penance which is itself the first of all and opens the door to the others by expelling sin on the contrary penance results from faith hope and charity as already stated in articles two and five therefore 
penance is not the first of the virtues. I answer that, in speaking of the virtues, we do not consider the order of time with regard to the habits, because, since the virtues are connected with one another, as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secundae, question 65, article 1, they all begin at the same time to be in the soul. But one is said to precede the other in the order of nature, which order depends on the order of their acts, in so far as the act of one virtue presupposes the act of another. Accordingly, then, one must say that, even in the order of time, certain praiseworthy acts can precede the act and the habit of penance, for example, acts of dead faith and hope and an act of servile fear. While the act and habit of charity are, in point of time, simultaneous with the act in the justification of the ungodly, the movement of the free will towards God, which is an act of faith quickened by charity, and the movement of the free will towards sin, which is the act of penance, are simultaneous. Yet of these two acts, the former naturally precedes the latter, because the act of the virtue of penance is directed against sin through love of God, where the first mentioned act is the reason and cause of the second. Consequently, penance is not simply the first of the virtues, either in the order of time or in the order of nature, because in the order of nature the theological virtues precede it simply. Nevertheless, in a certain respect, it is the first of the other virtues in the order of time as regards its act, because this act is the first in the justification of the ungodly, whereas in the order of nature the other virtues seem to precede, as that which is natural precedes that which is accidental. Because the other virtues seem to be necessary for man's good by reason of their very nature, whereas penance is only necessary if something, namely sin, be presupposed, as stated above in question 55, article 2, when we spoke of the relation of the sacrament of penance to the other sacraments aforesaid. Reply to Objection 1. This gloss is to be taken as meaning that the act of penance is the first in point of time in comparison with the acts of the other virtues. Reply to Objection 2. In successive movements, withdrawal from one extreme precedes approach to the other in point of time, and also in the order of nature, if we consider the subject, that is, the order of the material cause. But if we consider the order of the efficient and final causes, approach to the end is first, for it is this that the efficient cause intends first of all, and it is this order which we consider chiefly in the acts of the soul, as stated in Physics 2. Reply to Objection 3. Penance opens the door to the other virtues, because it expels sin by the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, which precede it in the order of nature. Yet it so opens the door to them that they enter at the same time as it. Because, in the justification of the ungodly, at the same time as the free will is moved towards God and against sin, the sin is pardoned and grace infused, and with grace all the virtues, as stated in the Pars Prima Secundae, question 65, articles 3 and 5. End of question 85. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 86 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 86 of the Effect of Penance as Regards the Pardon of Mortal Sin in Six Articles. We must now consider the effect of penance, and one, as regards the pardon of mortal sin, two, as regards the pardon of venial sins, three, as regards the return of sins which have been pardoned, four, 
as regards the recovery of the virtues. Under the first head, there are six points of inquiry. First, whether all mortal sins are taken away by penance. Second, whether they can be taken away without penance. Third, whether one can be taken away without the other. Fourth, whether penance takes away the guilt while the debt remains. Fifth, whether any remnants of sin remain. Sixth, whether the removal of sin is the effect of penance as a virtue or as a sacrament. First article, whether all sins are taken away by penance. Objection 1. It would seem that not all sins are taken away by penance. For the Apostle says in Hebrews 12.17 that Esau found no place of repentance, although with tears he had sought it, which a gloss explains as meaning that he found no place of pardon and blessing through penance. And it is related in Second Maccabees 9.13 of Antiochus that this wicked man prayed to the Lord, of whom he was not to obtain mercy. Therefore, it does not seem that all sins are taken away by penance. Objection to further. Augustine says in his commentary on the Sermon of the Mount 1 that, So great is the stain of that sin, namely, when a man, after coming to the knowledge of God through the grace of Christ, resists fraternal charity, and by the brands of envy combats grace itself that he is unable to humble himself in prayer, although he is forced by his wicked conscience to acknowledge and confess his sin. Therefore, not every sin can be taken away by penance. Objection 3 further. Our Lord said in Matthew 12, verse 32, He that shall speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Therefore, not every sin can be pardoned through penance. On the contrary, it is written in Ezekiel 18, verse 22, I will not remember any more all his iniquities that he hath done. I answer that. The fact that a sin cannot be taken away by penance may happen in two ways. First, because of the impossibility of repenting of sin, Secondly, because of penance being unable to blot out a sin. In the first way, the sins of the demons and of men who are lost cannot be blotted out by penance, because their will is confirmed in evil, so that sin cannot displease them as to its guilt, but only as to the punishment which they suffer, by reason of which they have a kind of repentance, which is yet fruitless, according to Wisdom 5.3, repenting and groaning for anguish of spirit. Consequently, such penance brings no hope of pardon, but only despair. Nevertheless, no sin of a wayfarer can be such as that, because his will is flexible to good and evil. Wherefore to say that in this life there is any sin of which one cannot repent is erroneous. First, because this would destroy free will. Secondly, because this would be derogatory to the power of grace whereby the heart of any sinner whatsoever can be moved to repent, according to Proverbs 21, verse 1. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Whithersoever he will, he shall turn it. It is also erroneous to say that any sin cannot be pardoned through true penance. First, because this is contrary to divine mercy, of which it is written in Joel 2, verse 13, that God is gracious and merciful patient and rich in mercy, and ready to repent of the evil. For in a manner, God would be overcome by man, if man wished a sin to be blotted out, which God were unwilling to blot out. Secondly, because this would be derogatory to the power of Christ's passion, through which penance produces its effect, as do the other sacraments, since it is written in 1 John 2, 2 He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Therefore, we must simply say that, in this life, every sin can be blotted out by true penance. 
Reply to Objection 1. Esau did not truly repent. This is evident from his saying in Genesis 27 verse 41, The days will come of the morning of my father, and I will kill my brother Jacob. Likewise, neither did Antiochus repent truly, since he grieved for his past sin, not because he had offended God thereby, but on account of the sickness which he suffered in his body. Reply to Objection 2. These words of Augustine should be understood thus. So great is the stain of that sin that man is unable to humble himself in prayer. That is, it is not easy for him to do so, in which sense we say that a man cannot be healed when it is difficult to heal him. Yet this is possible by the power of God's grace, which sometimes turns men even into the depths of the sea, according to Psalm 67, verse 23. Reply to Objection 3. The word or blasphemy spoken against the Holy Ghost is final impenitence, as Augustine states, which is altogether unpardonable, because after this life is ended, there is no pardon of sins. Or, if by blasphemy against the Holy Ghost we understand sin committed through certain malice, this means either that the blasphemy itself against the Holy Ghost is unpardonable, that is, not easily pardonable, or that such a sin does not contain in itself any motive for pardon, or that for such a sin a man is punished both in this and in the next world, as we explained in Question 14, Article 3. Second Article. Whether Sin Can Be Pardoned Without Penance Objection 1. It would seem that sin can be pardoned without penance. For the power of God is no less with regard to adults than with regard to children. But he pardons the sins of children without penance. Therefore he also pardons adults without penance. Objection to further. God did not bind his power to the sacraments, but penance is a sacrament. Therefore, by God's power, sin can be pardoned without penance. Objection 3 further. God's mercy is greater than man's. Now man sometimes forgives another for offending him without his repenting, wherefore our Lord commanded us in Matthew 5 verse 44, Love your enemies, do good to them that hate you. Much more, therefore, does God pardon men for offending him without their repenting. On the contrary, the Lord said in Jeremiah 18 verse 8, if that nation shall repent of their evil, which they have done, I also will repent of the evil that I have thought to do to them. So that, on the other hand, if man do not penance, it seems that God will not pardon him his sin. I answer that, it is impossible for a mortal actual sin to be pardoned without penance, if we speak of penance as a virtue. For as sin is an offense against God, he pardons sin in the same way as he pardons an offense committed against him. Now an offense is directly opposed to grace, since one man is said to be offended with another because he excludes him from his grace. Now as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secundae question 110, article 1, the difference between the grace of God and the grace of man is that the latter does not cause, but presupposes, true or apparent goodness in him who is graced, whereas the grace of God causes goodness in the man who is graced, because the good will of God, which is denoted by the word grace, is the cause of all created good. Hence it is possible for a man to pardon an offense, for which he is offended with someone, without any change in the latter's will, but it is impossible that God pardon a man for an offense without his will being changed. Now the offense of mortal sin is due to man's will being turned away from God through being turned to some mutable good. Consequently, for the pardon of this offense against God, it is necessary for man's will to be so changed as to turn to God and to renounce having turned to something else in the aforesaid manner, together with the purpose of amendment all of which belongs to the nature of penance, as a virtue. Therefore, it is impossible for a sin to be pardoned anyone 
without penance as a virtue but the sacrament of penance as stated above in question eighty eight article three is perfected by the priestly office of binding and loosing without which god can forgive sins even as christ pardoned the adulterous woman as related in john eight and the woman that was a sinner as related in luke chapter seven whose sins however he did not forget without the virtue of penance for as gregory states in a homily he drew inwardly by grace that is by penance her whom he received outwardly by his mercy reply to objection one in children there is none but original sin which consists not in an actual disorder of the will but in a habitual disorder of nature as explained in the second part pars prima secunde question eighty two article one and so in them the forgiveness of sin is accompanied by a habitual change resulting from the infusion of grace and virtues but not by an actual change on the other hand in the case of an adult in whom there are actual sins which consist in an actual disorder of the will there is no remission of sins even in baptism without an actual change of the will which is the effect of penance reply to objection to this argument takes penance as a sacrament reply to objection three god's mercy is more powerful than man's in that it moves man's will to repent which man's mercy cannot do third article whether by penance one sin can be pardoned without another objection one it would seem that by penance one sin can be pardoned without another for it is written in amos four verse seven i caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city one piece was rained upon and the piece whereupon i rain not withered these words are expounded by gregory who says in a homily when a man who hates his neighbor breaks himself of other vices rain falls on one part of the city leaving the other part withered for there are some men who while they prune some vices become much more rooted in others therefore one sin can be forgiven by penance without another objection to further ambrose in commenting on psalm 118 blessed are the undefiled in the way after expounding verse 136 my eyes have sent forth springs of water says that the first consolation is that god is mindful to have mercy and the second that he punishes for although faith be wanting punishment makes satisfaction and raises us up therefore a man can be raised up from one sin while the sin of unbelief remains objection three further when several things are not necessarily together one can be removed without the other now it was stated in the second part in the pars prima secunde question seventy three article one that sins are not connected together so that one sin cannot be without another therefore also one sin can be taken away by penance without another being taken away objection for further sins are the debts for which we pray for pardon when we say in the lord's prayer forgive us our trespasses etc no man sometimes forgives one debt without forgiving another therefore god also by penance forgives one sin without another objection five further man's sins are forgiven him through the love of god according to jeremiah thirty one three i have loved thee with an everlasting love therefore i have drawn thee taking pity on thee now there is nothing to hinder god from loving a man in one respect while being offended with him in another even as he loves the sinner as regards his nature while hating him for his sin therefore it seems possible for god by penance to pardon one sin without another on the contrary augustine says in on penance there are many who repent having sinned but not completely for they accept certain things which give them pleasure forgetting that our lord delivered from the devil the man who is both dumb and deaf whereby he shows us that we are never healed 
unless it be from all sins. I answer that. It is impossible for penance to take away one sin without another. First, because sin is taken away by grace, removing the offense against God. Wherefore, it was stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secunde, question 109, article 7, as well as in question 113, article 2, that without grace, no sin can be forgiven. Now, every mortal sin is opposed to grace and excludes it. Therefore, it is impossible for one sin to be pardoned without another. Secondly, because as was shown above in Article 2, mortal sin cannot be forgiven without true penance, to which it belongs to renounce sin by reason of its being against God, which is common to all mortal sins. And where the same reason applies, the result will be the same. Consequently, a man cannot be truly penitent if you repent of one sin and not of another. For if one particular sin were displeasing to him because it is against the love of God above all things, which motive is necessary for true repentance, it follows that he would repent of all. Whence it follows that it is impossible for one sin to be pardoned through penance without another. Thirdly, because this would be contrary to the perfection of God's mercy since his works are perfect, as stated in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, wherefore, whomsoever he pardons, he pardons altogether. Hence Augustine says that it is irreverent and heretical to expect half a pardon from him who is just and justice itself. Reply to Objection 1. These words of Gregory do not refer to the forgiveness of the guilt, but to the cessation from act, because sometimes a man who has been wont to commit several kinds of sin renounces one and not the other, which is indeed due to God's assistance, but does not reach to the pardon of the sin. Reply to Objection 2. In this saying of Ambrose, faith cannot denote the faith whereby we believe in Christ, because as Augustine says on John 15.22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, namely unbelief, for this is the sin which contains all others. But it stands for consciousness, because sometimes a man receives pardon for a sin of which he is not conscious, through the punishment which he bears patiently. Reply to Objection 3. Although sins are not connected in so far as they turn towards a mutable good, yet they are connected in so far as they turn away from the immutable good, which applies to all mortal sins in common, and it is thus that they have the character of an offense which needs to be removed by penance. Reply to Objection 4. Debt, as regards external things, for example money, is not opposed to friendship through which the debt is pardoned. Hence one debt can be condoned without another. On the other hand, the debt of sin is opposed to friendship, and so one sin or offense is not pardoned without another. For it would seem absurd for anyone to ask even a man to forgive him one offense and not another. Reply to Objection 5. The love whereby God loves man's nature does not ordain man to the good of glory from which man is excluded by any mortal sin, but the love of grace whereby mortal sin is forgiven, ordains man to eternal life, according to Romans 6, verse 23. The grace of God is life everlasting. Hence there is no comparison. Fourth article. Whether the debt of punishment remains after the guilt has been forgiven through penance. Objection 1. It would seem that no debt of punishment remains after the guilt has been forgiven through penance. For when the cause is removed, the effect is removed. But the guilt is the cause of the debt of punishment, since a man deserves to be punished because he has been guilty of a sin. Therefore, when the sin has been forgiven, no debt of punishment can remain. Objection to further. According to the Apostle in Romans 5, the gift of Christ is more effective than the sin of Adam. Now by sinning, 
man incurs at the same time a guilt and the debt of punishment much more therefore by the gift of grace is the guilt forgiven and at the same time the debt of punishment remitted objection three further the forgiveness of sins is effected in penance through the power of christ's passion according to romans three verse twenty five whom god hath proposed to be a propitiation through faith in his blood for the remission of former sins now christ's passion made satisfaction sufficient for all sins as stated above in questions forty eight forty nine seventy nine article five therefore after the guilt has been pardoned no debt of punishment remains on the contrary it is related in second kings twelve thirteen that when david penitent had said to nathan i have sinned against the lord nathan said to him the lord also hath taken away thy sin thou shalt not die nevertheless the child that is born to thee shall surely die which was to punish him for the sin he had committed as stated in the same place therefore a debt of some punishment remains after the guilt has been forgiven i answer that as stated in the second part in the pars prima secundae question eighty seven article four in mortal sin there are two things namely a turning from the immutable good and an inordinate turning to mutable good accordingly in so far as mortal sin turns away from the immutable good it induces a debt of eternal punishment so that whoever sins against the eternal good should be punished eternally again in so far as mortal sin turns inordinately to a mutable good it gives rise to a debt of some punishment because the disorder of guilt is not brought back to the order of justice except by punishment since it is just that he who has been too indulgent to his will should suffer something against his will for thus will equality be restored hence it is written in apocalypse eighteen verse seven as much as she hath glorified herself and lived in delicacies so much torment and sorrow give ye to her since however the turning to mutable good is finite sin does not in this respect induce a debt of eternal punishment wherefore if man turns inordinately to a mutable good without turning from god as happens in venial sins he incurs a debt not of eternal but of temporal punishment consequently when guilt is pardoned through grace the soul ceases to be turned away from god through being united to god by grace so that at the same time the debt of punishment is taken away albeit a debt of some temporal punishment may yet remain reply to objection one mortal sin both turns away from god and turns to a created good but as stated in the second part the pars prima secundae question seventy one article six the turning away from god is as its form while the turning to created good is as its matter now if the formal element of anything be removed the species is taken away thus if you take away rational you take away the human species consequently mortal sin is said to be pardoned from the very fact that by means of grace the aversion of the mind from god is taken away together with the debt of eternal punishment and yet the material element remains namely the inordinate turning to a created good for which a debt of temporal punishment is due reply to objection two as stated in the second part the pars prima secundae question one hundred and nine article seven and eight as well as in question one hundred and eleven article two it belongs to grace to operate in man by justifying him from sin and to cooperate with man that his work might be rightly done consequently the forgiveness of guilt and of the debt of eternal punishment belongs to operating grace while the remission of the debt of temporal punishment belongs to co-operating grace in so far as man by bearing punishment patiently with the help of divine grace 
is released also from the debt of temporal punishment. Consequently, just as the effect of operating grace precedes the effect of co-operating grace, so too the remission of guilt and of eternal punishment precedes the complete release from temporal punishment, since both are from grace, but the former from grace alone, the latter from grace and free will. Reply to Objection 3. Christ's passion is of itself sufficient to remove all debt of punishment, not only eternal, but also temporal. And man is released from the debt of punishment according to the measure of his share in the power of Christ's passion. Now in baptism, man shares in the power of Christ's passion fully, since by water and the Spirit of Christ he dies with him to sin and is born again in him to a new life so that in baptism man receives the remission of all debt of punishment. In penance, on the other hand, man shares in the power of Christ's passion according to the measure of his own acts, which are the matter of penance, as water is of baptism, as stated above, in question 84, articles 1 and 3. Wherefore, the entire debt of punishment is not remitted at once after the first act of penance, by which act the guilt is remitted, but only when all the acts of penance have been completed. Fifth article. Whether the remnants of sin are removed when a mortal sin is forgiven. Objection 1. It would seem that all the remnants of sin are removed when a mortal sin is forgiven. For Augustine says in On Penance, Our Lord never healed anyone without delivering him wholly for he wholly healed the man on the Sabbath, since he delivered his body from all disease and his soul from all taint. Now the remnants of sin belong to the disease of sin. Therefore, it does not seem possible for any remnants of sin to remain when the guilt has been pardoned. Objection to further. According to Dionysius in On the Divine Names 4, Good is more efficacious than evil, since evil does not act save in virtue of some good. Now by sinning, man incurs the taint of sin all at once. Much more, therefore, by repenting, is he delivered also from all remnants of sin. Objection 3 further. God's work is more efficacious than man's. Now by the exercise of good human works, the remnants of contrary sins are removed. Much more, therefore, are they taken away by the remission of guilt, which is a work of God. On the contrary, we read in Mark 8 that the blind man, whom our Lord enlightened, was restored first of all to imperfect sight, wherefore he said, at verse 24, I see men, as it were, trees walking and afterwards he was restored perfectly, so that he saw all things clearly. Now the enlightenment of the blind man signifies the delivery of the sinner. Therefore, after the first remission of sin, whereby the sinner is restored to spiritual sight, there still remain in him some remnants of his past sin. I answer that, mortal sin, in so far as it turns inordinately to a mutable good, produces in the soul a certain disposition, or even a habit, if the acts be repeated frequently. Now it has been said above in Article 4 that the guilt of mortal sin is pardoned through grace, removing the aversion of the mind from God. Nevertheless, when that which is on the part of the aversion has been taken away by grace, that which is on the part of the inordinate turning to a mutable good can remain since this may happen to be without the other, as stated above in Article 4. Consequently, there is no reason why, after the guilt has been forgiven, the dispositions caused by preceding acts should not remain, which are called the remnants of sin. Yet they remain weakened and diminished, so as not to domineer over man, and they are after the manner of dispositions rather than of habits, like the fomes which remains after baptism. Reply to Objection 1. God heals the whole man perfectly, but sometimes suddenly, as Peter's mother-in-law was restored at once to perfect health, 
so that rising she ministered to them, according to Luke 4, verse 39. And sometimes by degrees, as we said above in question 44, article 3, second reply, about the blind man who is restored to sight, according to Matthew chapter 8. And so too, he sometimes turns the heart of man with such power that it receives at once perfect spiritual health, not only the guilt being pardoned, but all remnants of sin being removed, as was the case with Magdalene, as seen in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Whereas at other times, he sometimes first pardons the guilt by operating grace, and afterwards, by co-operating grace, removes the remnants of sin by degrees. Reply to Objection 2 Sin, too, sometimes induces at once a weak disposition, such as is the result of one act, and sometimes a stronger disposition, the result of many acts. Reply to Objection 3 One human act does not remove all the remnants of sin, because, as stated in the Categories 8, a vicious man by doing good works will make but little progress so as to be any better, but if he continue in good practice, he will end in being good as to acquired virtue. But God's grace does this much more effectively, whether by one or by several acts. Sixth article. Whether the forgiveness of guilt is an effect of penance. Objection 1. It would seem that the forgiveness of guilt is not an effect of penance as a virtue. For penance is said to be a virtue in so far as it is a principle of a human action. But human action does nothing towards the remission of guilt, since this is an effect of operating grace. Therefore, the forgiveness of guilt is not an effect of penance as a virtue. Objection to further. Certain other virtues are more excellent than penance. But the forgiveness of sin is not said to be the effect of any other virtue. Neither, therefore, is it the effect of penance as a virtue. Objection 3 further. There is no forgiveness of sin except through the power of Christ's passion, according to Hebrews 9 verse 22. Without shedding of blood there is no remission. Now penance, as a sacrament, produces its effect through the power of Christ's passion, even as the other sacraments do, as was shown above in question 62, articles 4 and 5. Therefore, the forgiveness of sin is the effect of penance, not as a virtue, but as a sacrament. On the contrary, properly speaking, the cause of a thing is that without which it cannot be, since every defect depends on its cause. Now forgiveness of sin can come from God without the sacrament of penance, but not without the virtue of penance, as stated above, in question 84, article 5, third reply, and in question 85, article 2. So that, even before the sacraments of the new law were instituted, God pardoned the sins of the penitent. Therefore, the forgiveness of sin is chiefly the effect of penance as a virtue. I answer that. Penance is a virtue in so far as it is a principle of certain human acts. Now the human acts, which are performed by the sinner, are the material element in the sacrament of penance. Moreover, every sacrament produces its effect in virtue not only of its form, but also of its matter, because both these together make the one sacrament as stated above, in question 60, article 6, second reply, as well as in article 7. Hence in baptism, forgiveness of sin is effected in virtue not only of the form, but also of the matter, namely water, albeit chiefly in virtue of the form from which the water receives its power. And similarly, the forgiveness of sin is the effect of penance, chiefly by the power of the keys which is vested in the ministers, who furnish the formal part of the sacrament as stated above, in question 84, article 3. And secondarily, by the instrumentality of those acts of the penitent which pertain to the virtue of penance, 
but only in so far as such acts are in some way subordinate to the keys of the church accordingly it is evident that the forgiveness of sin is the effect of penance as a virtue but still more of penance as a sacrament reply to objection one the effect of operating grace is the justification of the ungodly as stated in the second part the pars prima secunde question 113 wherein there is as was there stated in articles 1 2 and 3 not only infusion of grace and forgiveness of sin but also a movement of the free will towards god which is an act of faith quickened by charity and a movement of the free will against sin which is the act of penance yet these human acts are there as the effects of operating grace and are produced at the same time as the forgiveness of sin consequently the forgiveness of sin does not take place without the act of the virtue of penance although it is the effect of operating grace reply to objection to in the justification of the ungodly there is not only an act of penance but also an act of faith as stated above in the first reply as well as in the pars prima secunde question 113 article 4 wherefore the forgiveness of sin is accounted the effect not only of the virtue of penance but also and that chiefly of faith and charity reply to objection three the act of the virtue of penance is subordinate to christ's passion both by faith and by its relation to the keys of the church and so in both ways it causes the forgiveness of sin by the power of christ's passion to the argument advanced in the contrary sense we reply that the act of the virtue of penance is necessary for the forgiveness of sin through being an inseparable effect of grace whereby chiefly is sin pardoned and which produces its effect in all the sacraments consequently it only follows that grace is a higher cause of the forgiveness of sin than the sacrament of penance moreover it must be observed that under the old law and the law of nature there was a sacrament of penance after a fashion as stated above in question eighty four article seven second reply end of question eighty six read by michael shane craig lambert l c Question 87 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 87 of the Remission of Venial Sin in Four Articles. We must now consider the forgiveness of venial sins under which head there are four points of inquiry first whether venial sin can be forgiven without penance second whether it can be forgiven without the infusion of grace third whether venial sins are forgiven by the sprinkling of holy water a bishop's blessing the beating of the breast the lord's prayer and the like fourth whether a venial sin can be taken away without a mortal sin first article whether venial sin can be forgiven without penance objection one it would seem that venial sin can be forgiven without penance for as stated above in question eighty four article ten fourth reply it is essential to true penance that man should not only sorrow for his past sins but also that he should purpose to avoid them for the future now venial sins are forgiven without any such purpose for it is certain that man cannot lead the present life without committing venial sins therefore venial sins can be forgiven without penance objection to further there is no penance without actual displeasure at one's sins but venial sins can be taken away without any actual displeasure at them as would be the case if a man were to be killed in his sleep for christ's sake since he would go to heaven at once which would not happen if his venial sins remained therefore 
venial sins can be forgiven without penance. Objection 3 further. Venial sins are contrary to the fervor of charity, as stated in the second part, in the parts Secunda Secunde, question 24, article 10. Now one contrary is removed by another. Therefore, forgiveness of venial sins is caused by the fervor of charity, which may be without actual displeasure at venial sin. On the contrary, Augustine says in On Penance that there is a penance which is done for venial sins in the church every day, which would be useless if venial sins could be forgiven without penance. I answer that, forgiveness of sin, as stated above in question 86, article 2, is effected by man being united to God from whom sin separates him in some way. Now this separation is made complete by mortal sin, and incomplete by venial sin. Because by mortal sin, the mind, through acting against charity, is altogether turned away from God, whereas by venial sin, man's affections are clogged, so that they are slow in tending towards God. Consequently, both kinds of sin are taken away by penance, because by both of them, man's will is disordered through turning inordinately to a created good. For just as mortal sin cannot be forgiven so long as the will is attached to sin, so neither can venial sin, because while the cause remains, the effect remains. Yet a more perfect penance is requisite for the forgiveness of mortal sin, namely that man should detest actually the mortal sin which he committed, so far as lies in his power, that is to say, he should endeavor to remember each single mortal sin in order to detest each one. But this is not required for the forgiveness of venial sins, although it does not suffice to have habitual displeasure, which is included in the habit of charity or of penance as a virtue, since then venial sin would be incompatible with charity, which is evidently untrue. Consequently, it is necessary to have a certain virtual displeasure, so that, for instance, a man's affections so tend to God and divine things, that whatever might happen to him to hamper that tendency would be displeasing to him, and would grieve him were he to commit it, even though he were not to think of it actually. And this is not sufficient for the remission of mortal sin, except as regards those sins which he fails to remember after a careful examination. Reply to Objection 1. When man is in a state of grace, he can avoid all mortal sins, and each single one, and he can avoid each single venial sin, but not all, as was explained in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secunde, question 74, article 8, second reply, as well as in question 109, article 8. Consequently, Penance for mortal sins requires man to purpose abstaining from mortal sins, all and each, whereas penance for venial sins requires man to purpose abstaining from each, but not from all because the weakness of this life does not allow of this. Nevertheless, he needs to have the purpose of taking steps to commit fewer venial sins, else he would be in danger of falling back, if he gave up the desire of going forward or of removing the obstacles to spiritual progress, such as venial sins are. Reply to Objection 2. Death, for Christ's sake, as stated above in question 66, article 11, obtains the power of baptism, wherefore it washes away all sin, both venial and mortal, unless it find the will attached to sin. Reply to Objection 3. The fervor of charity implies virtual displeasure at venial sins, as stated above in question 79, article 4. Second article. Whether infusion of grace is necessary for the remission of venial sins. Objection 1. It would seem that infusion of grace is necessary for the remission of venial sins, because an effect is not produced without its proper cause. Now the proper cause of the remission of sins is grace, for man's sins are not forgiven through his own merits. 
Wherefore it is written in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, God, who is rich in mercy for his exceeding charity, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ, by whose grace you are saved. Therefore, venial sins are not forgiven without the infusion of grace. Objection to further. Venial sins are not forgiven without penance. Now grace is infused in penance as in the other sacraments of the new law. Therefore, venial sins are not forgiven without infusion of grace. Objection 3 further. Venial sin produces a stain on the soul. Now a stain is not removed save by grace which is the spiritual beauty of the soul. Therefore it seems that venial sins are not forgiven without infusion of grace. On the contrary, the advent of venial sin neither destroys nor diminishes grace, as stated in the second part, in the part Secunda Secunde, question 24, article 10. Therefore, in like manner, an infusion of grace is not necessary in order to remove venial sin. I answer that each thing is removed by its contrary, but venial sin is not contrary to habitual grace or charity, but hampers its act through man being too much attached to a created good, albeit not in opposition to God as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secunde, question 88, article 1, and in the Pars Secunda Secunde, question 24, article 10. Therefore, in order that venial sin be removed, it is not necessary that habitual grace be infused, but a movement of grace or charity suffices for its forgiveness. Nevertheless, since in those who have the use of free will, in whom alone can there be venial sins, there can be no infusion of grace without an actual movement of the free will towards God and against sin, consequently, whenever grace is infused anew, venial sins are forgiven. Reply to Objection 1 even the forgiveness of venial sins is an effect of grace, in virtue of the act which grace produces anew, but not through any habit infused anew in the soul. Reply to Objection 2. Venial sin is never forgiven without some act, explicit or implicit, of the virtue of penance, as stated above in Article 1. It can, however, be forgiven without the sacrament of penance, which is formally perfected by the priestly absolution as stated above in question 87, article 2. Hence, it does not follow that infusion of grace is required for the forgiveness of venial sin, for although this infusion takes place in every sacrament, it does not occur in every act of virtue. Reply to Objection 3. Just as there are two kinds of bodily stain, one consisting in the privation of something required for beauty, for example, the right color or the due proportion of members, and another by the introduction of some hindrance to beauty, for example, mud or dust, so too a stain is put on the soul in one way, by the privation of the beauty of grace through mortal sin, in another, by the inordinate inclination of the affections to some temporal thing, and this is the result of venial sin. Consequently, an infusion of grace is necessary for the removal of mortal sin, but in order to remove venial sin, it is necessary to have a movement proceeding from grace, removing the inordinate attachment to the temporal thing. Third article. Whether venial sins are removed by the sprinkling of holy water and the like. Objection 1 it would seem that venial sins are not removed by the sprinkling of holy water, a bishop's blessing, and the like. For venial sins are not forgiven without penance, as stated above in Article 1. But penance suffices by itself for the remission of venial sins. Therefore the above have nothing to do with the remission of venial sins. Objection to further. Each of the above bears the same relation to one venial sin as to all. If, therefore, by means of one of them some venial sin is remitted, 
it follows that in like manner all are remitted, so that by beating his breast once, or by being sprinkled once with holy water, a man would be delivered from all his venial sins, which seems unreasonable. Objection 3 further. Venial sins occasion a debt of some punishment, albeit temporal. For it is written in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 and 15 of him that builds up wood, hay, stubble, that he shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now the above things whereby venial sins are said to be taken away contain either no punishment at all or very little. Therefore, they do not suffice for the full remission of venial sins. On the contrary, Augustine says in On Penance that for our slight sins we strike our breasts and say, Forgive us our trespasses. And so it seems that striking one's breast and the Lord's Prayer caused the remission of venial sins, and the same seems to apply to other things. I answer that, as stated above in Article 2, no infusion of fresh grace is required for the forgiveness of a venial sin, but it is enough to have an act proceeding from grace in detestation of that venial sin, either explicit or at least implicit, as when one is moved fervently to God. Hence, for three reasons, certain things cause the remission of venial sins. First, because they imply the infusion of grace, since the infusion of grace removes venial sins, as stated above in Article 2. And so, by the Eucharist, extreme unction, and by all the sacraments of the new law without exception, wherein grace is conferred, venial sins are remitted. Secondly, because they would imply a movement of detestation for sin, and in this way the general confession, the beating of one's breast, and the Lord's Prayer, conduce to the remission of venial sins, for we ask in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our trespasses. Thirdly, because they include a movement of reverence for God and divine things. And in this way, a bishop's blessing, the sprinkling of holy water, any sacramental anointing, a prayer said in a dedicated church, and anything else of the kind conduce to the remission of venial sins. Reply to Objection 1. All these things cause the remission of venial sins insofar as they incline the soul to the movement of penance, namely, the implicit or explicit detestation of one's sins. Reply to Objection 2. All these things, so far as they are concerned, conduce to the remission of all venial sins, but the remission may be hindered as regards certain venial sins, to which the mind is still actually attached, even as insincerity sometimes impedes the effect of baptism. Reply to Objection 3. By the above things, venial sins are indeed taken away as regards the guilt, both because those things are a kind of satisfaction, and through the virtue of charity whose movement is aroused by such things. Yet it does not always happen that, by means of each one, the whole guilt of punishment is taken away, because in that case whoever was entirely free from mortal sin would go straight to heaven if sprinkled with holy water. But the debt of punishment is remitted by means of the above, according to the movement of fervor towards God, which fervor is aroused by such things, sometimes more, sometimes less. Fourth article. Whether venial sin can be taken away without mortal sin. Objection 1. It would seem that venial sin can be taken away without mortal sin. For on John 8, verse 7, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. A gloss says that all those men were in a state of mortal sin, for venial offenses were forgiven them through the legal ceremonies. Therefore, venial sin can be taken away without mortal sin. Objection to further. No infusion of grace is required for the remission of venial sin, but is required for the forgiveness of mortal sin. Therefore, 
venial sin can be taken away without mortal sin. Objection 3 further. A venial sin differs from a mortal sin more than from another venial sin. But one venial sin can be pardoned without another, as stated above in Article 3, Second Reply, as well as in Question 87, Article 3. Therefore, a venial sin can be taken away without a mortal sin. On the contrary, it is written in Matthew chapter 5, verse 26, Amen, I say to thee, thou shalt not go out from thence, namely, from the prison, into which a man is cast for mortal sin, till thou repay the last farthing, by which venial sin is denoted. Therefore, a venial sin is not forgiven without mortal sin. I answer that, as stated above in question 87, article 3, there is no remission of any sin whatever, except by the power of grace, because, as the Apostle declares in Romans 4, verse 8, it is owing to God's grace that he does not impute sin to a man, which a gloss on that passage expounds as referring to venial sin. Now he that is in a state of mortal sin is without the grace of God. Therefore, no venial sin is forgiven him. Reply to Objection 1. Venial offenses, in the passage quoted, denote the irregularities or uncleannesses which men contracted in accordance with the law. Reply to Objection 2. Although no new infusion of habitual grace is requisite for the remission of venial sin, yet it is necessary to exercise some act of grace, which cannot be in one who is a subject of mortal sin. Reply to Objection 3. Venial sin does not preclude every act of grace whereby all venial sins can be removed, whereas mortal sin excludes altogether the habit of grace without which no sin, either mortal or venial, is remitted. Hence the comparison fails. End of question 87. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. Question 88. Of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 88. Of the return of sins which have been taken away by penance, in four articles. We must now consider the return of sins which have been taken away by penance, under which head there are four points of inquiry. First, whether sins which have been taken away by penance return simply through a subsequent sin. Second, whether more specially as regards certain sins they return, in a way, on account of ingratitude. Third, whether the debt of punishment remains the same for sins thus returned. Fourth, whether this ingratitude, on account of which sins return, is a special sin. First article. Whether sins once forgiven return through a subsequent sin. Objection 1. It would seem that sins once forgiven return through a subsequent sin. For Augustine says on baptism against the Donatists, one twelve, Our Lord teaches most explicitly in the Gospel that sins which have been forgiven return when fraternal charity ceases in the example of the servant from whom his master exacted the payment of the debt already forgiven, because he had refused to forgive the debt of his fellow-servant. Now fraternal charity is destroyed through each mortal sin. Therefore, sins already taken away through penance return through each subsequent mortal sin. Objection to further. On Luke chapter 11 verse 24, I will return into my house whence I came out. Bede says, This verse should make us tremble. We should not endeavor to explain it away, lest through carelessness we give place to the sin which we thought to have been taken away and become its slave once more. Now this would not be so, 
unless it returned. Therefore, a sin returns after once being taken away by penance. Objection 3 further. The Lord said in Ezekiel 18.24, If the just man turn himself away from his justice and do iniquity, all his justices which he hath done shall not be remembered. Now among the other justices which he had done is also his previous penance, since it was said above in question 85, article 3, that penance is a part of justice. Therefore, when one who has done penance sins, his previous penance, whereby he received forgiveness of his sins, is not imputed to him. Therefore his sins return. Objection 4 further. Past sins are covered by grace, as the Apostle declares in Romans 4, verse 7, where he quotes Psalm 31, verse 1, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. But a subsequent mortal sin takes away grace. Therefore the sins committed previously become uncovered, and so seemingly they return. On the contrary, the Apostle says in Romans 11, verse 29, The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Now the penitent's sins are taken away by a gift of God. Therefore, the sins which have been taken away do not return through a subsequent sin as though God repented his gift of forgiveness. Moreover, Augustine says in his replies to Prosper in the Gallic chapter 2, when he that turns away from Christ comes to the end of this life a stranger to grace, whither does he go except to perdition? Yet he does not fall back into that which had been forgiven, nor will he be condemned for original sin. I answer that as stated above in question 86, article 4. Mortal sin contains two things, aversion from God and adherence to a created good. Now in mortal sin, whatever attaches to the aversion is, considered in itself, common to all mortal sins, since man turns away from God by every mortal sin, so that, in consequence, the stain resulting from the privation of grace and the debt of everlasting punishment are common to all mortal sins. This is what is meant by what is written in James 2 verse 10, Whosoever shall offend in one point is become guilty of all. On the other hand, as regards their adherence, they are different from, and sometimes contrary to, one another. Hence it is evident that on the part of the adherence, a subsequent mortal sin does not cause the return of mortal sins previously dispelled, else it would follow that by a sin of wastefulness a man would be brought back to the habit or disposition of avarice previously dispelled, so that one contrary would be the cause of another, which is impossible. But if in mortal sins we consider that which attaches to the aversion absolutely, then a subsequent mortal sin causes the return of that which was comprised in the mortal sins before they were pardoned, in so far as the subsequent mortal sin deprives man of grace and makes him deserving of everlasting punishment, just as he was before. Nevertheless, since the aversion of mortal sin is, in a way, caused by the adherence, those things which attach to the aversion are diversified somewhat in relation to various adherences, as it were to various causes, so that there would be a different aversion, a different stain, a different debt of punishment, according to the different acts of mortal sin from which they arise. Hence the question is moved whether the stain and the debt of eternal punishment as caused by acts of sin previously pardoned, return through a subsequent mortal sin. Accordingly, some have maintained that they return simply even in this way, but this is impossible, because what God has done cannot be undone by the work of man. Now the pardon of the previous sins was a work of divine mercy, so that it cannot be undone by man's subsequent sin according to Romans 3.3. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Wherefore others who maintained the possibility of sins returning said that God pardons the sins of a penitent who will afterwards sin again 
not according to his foreknowledge, but only according to his present justice. Since he foresees that he will punish such a man eternally for his sins, and yet by his grace he makes him righteous for the present. But this cannot stand, because if a cause be placed absolutely, its effect is placed absolutely. So that if the remission of sins were effected by grace and the sacraments of grace, not absolutely but under some condition dependent on some future event, it would follow that grace and the sacraments of grace are not the sufficient causes of the remission of sins, which is erroneous as being derogatory to God's grace. Consequently, it is in no way possible for the stain of past sins and the debt of punishment incurred thereby to return as caused by those acts. Yet it may happen that a subsequent sinful act virtually contains the debt of punishment due to the previous sin, in so far as when a man sins a second time, for this very reason he seems to sin more grievously than before, as stated in Romans 2 verse 5, according to thy hardness and impenitent heart, thou treasurest up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath. From the mere fact that, namely, God's goodness, which waits for us to repent, is despised. And so much the more is God's goodness despised, if the first sin is committed a second time, after having been forgiven, as it is a greater favor for the sin to be forgiven than for the sinner to be endured. Accordingly, the sin which follows repentance brings back, in a sense, the debt of punishment due to the sins previously forgiven, not as caused by those sins already forgiven, but as caused by this last sin being committed on account of its being aggravated in view of those previous sins. This means that those sins return not simply, but in a restricted sense, namely, in so far as they are virtually contained in the subsequent sin. Reply to Objection 1 This saying of Augustine seems to refer to the return of sins as to the debt of eternal punishment considered in itself, namely, that he who sins after doing penance incurs a debt of eternal punishment, just as before, but not altogether for the same reason. Wherefore Augustine, after saying that he does not fall back into that which was forgiven, nor will he be condemned for original sin, adds, Nevertheless, for these last sins, he will be condemned to the same death which he deserved to suffer for the former, because he incurs the punishment of eternal death which he deserved for his previous sins. Reply to Objection 2 by these words, bead means that the guilt already forgiven enslaves man, not by the return of his former debt of punishment, but by the repetition of his act. Reply to Objection 3. The effect of a subsequent sin is that the former justices are not remembered, in so far as they were deserving of eternal life, but not in so far as they were a hindrance to sin. Consequently, if a man sins mortally after making restitution, he does not become guilty as though he had not paid back what he owed, and much less is penance previously done forgotten as to the pardon of guilt, since this is the work of God rather than of man. Reply to Objection 4 Grace removes the stain and the debt of eternal punishment simply but it covers the past sinful acts, lest, on their account, God deprive man of grace, and judge him deserving of eternal punishment, and what grace has once done injures forever. Second article. Whether sins that have been forgiven return through ingratitude, which is shown especially in four kinds of sin. Objection 1 it would seem that sins do not return through ingratitude, which is shown especially in four kinds of sin, namely, hatred of one's neighbor, apostasy from faith, contempt of confession, and regret for past repentance, and which have been expressed in the following verse. Fratres odit apostata fit, spernitque fateri, 
poenituisse piget pristina culpa redit for the more grievous the sin committed against god after one has received the grace of pardon the greater the ingratitude but there are sins more grievous than these such as blasphemy against god and the sin against the holy ghost therefore it seems that sins already pardoned do not return through ingratitude as manifested in these sins any more than is shown in other sins objection to further rabbinus says god delivered the wicked servant to the torturers until he should pay the whole debt because a man will be deemed punishable not only for the sins he commits after baptism but also for original sin which was taken away when he was baptized now venial sins are reckoned among our debts since we pray in their regard forgive us our trespasses debita therefore they too return through ingratitude and in like manner seemingly sins already pardoned return through venial sins and not only through those sins mentioned above objection three further ingratitude is all the greater according as one sins after receiving a greater favor now innocence whereby one avoids sin is a divine favor for augustine says in confessions too whatever sins i have avoided committing i owe it to thy grace now innocence is a greater gift than even the forgiveness of all sins therefore the first sin committed after innocence is no less an ingratitude to god than a sin committed after repentance so that seemingly ingratitude in respect of the aforesaid sins is not the chief cause of sins returning on the contrary gregory says it is evident from the words of the gospel that if we do not forgive from our hearts the offences committed against us we become once more accountable for what we rejoiced in as forgiven through penance so that ingratitude implied in the hatred of one's brother is a special cause of the return of sins already forgiven and the same seems to apply to the others i answer that as stated above in article one sins pardoned through penance are said to return in so far as their debt of punishment by reason of ingratitude is virtually contained in the subsequent sin now one may be guilty of ingratitude in two ways first by doing something against the favor received and in this way man is ungrateful to god in every mortal sin whereby he offends god who forgave his sins so that by every subsequent mortal sin the sins previously pardoned return on account of the ingratitude secondly one is guilty of ingratitude by doing something not only against the favor itself but also against the form of the favor received if this form be considered on the part of the benefactor it is the remission of something due to him wherefore he who does not forgive his brother when he asks pardon and persists in his hatred acts against this form if however this form be taken in regard to the penitent who receives this favor we find on his part a twofold movement of the free will the first is the movement of the free will towards god and is an act of faith quickened by charity and against this a man acts by apostatizing from the faith the second is a movement of the free will against sin and is the act of penance this act consists first as we have stated above in question eighty five articles two and five in man's detestation of his past sins and against this a man acts when he regrets having done penance secondly the act of penance consists in the penitent proposing to subject himself to the keys of the church by confession according to psalm thirty one verse five i said i will confess against myself my injustice to the lord and thou hast forgiven the wickedness of my sin and against this a man acts when he scorns to confess as he had purposed to do accordingly it is said that the ingratitude of sinners is a special cause of the return of sins previously forgiven reply to objection one this is not said of these sins as though they were more grievous than others but because they are more directly opposed to the favor of the forgiveness of sin 
Reply to Objection 2. Even venial sins and original sin return in the way explained above, just as mortal sins do, in so far as the favor conferred by God in forgiving those sins is despised. A man does not, however, incur ingratitude by committing a venial sin, because by sinning venially man does not act against God but apart from him, wherefore venial sins nowise cause the return of sins already forgiven. Reply to Objection 3. A favor can be weighed in two ways. First, by the quantity of the favor itself, and in this way innocence is a greater favor from God than penance, which is called the second plank after shipwreck. Confer question 84, article 6. Secondly, a favor may be weighed with regard to the recipient, who is less worthy, wherefore a greater favor is bestowed on him, so that he is the more ungrateful if he scorns it. In this way the favor of the pardon of sins is greater when bestowed on one who is altogether unworthy, so that the ingratitude which follows is all the greater. Third article. Whether the debt of punishment that arises through ingratitude in respect of a subsequent sin is as great as that of the sins previously pardoned. Objection 1. It would seem that the debt of punishment arising through ingratitude in respect of a subsequent sin is as great as that of the sins previously pardoned. Because the greatness of the favor of the pardon of sins is according to the greatness of the sin pardoned, and so too, in consequence, is the greatness of the ingratitude whereby this favor is scorned. But the greatness of the consequent debt of punishment is in accord with the greatness of the ingratitude. Therefore, the debt of punishment arising through ingratitude in respect of a subsequent sin is as great as the debt of punishment due for all the previous sins. Objection to further. It is a greater sin to offend God than to offend man. But a slave who is freed by his master returns to the same state of slavery from which he was freed, or even to a worse state. Much more, therefore, he that sins against God after being freed from sin returns to the debt of as great a punishment as he had incurred before. Objection 3 further. It is written, in Matthew 18, verse 34, that his Lord being angry delivered him, whose sins returned to him on account of his ingratitude, to the torturers until he paid all the debt. But this would not be so unless the debt of punishment incurred through ingratitude were as great as that incurred through all previous sins. Therefore, an equal debt of punishment returns through ingratitude. On the contrary, it is written in Deuteronomy 25 verse 2, According to the measure of the sin shall the measure also of the stripes be. Whence it is evident that a great debt of punishment does not arise from a slight sin. But sometimes a subsequent mortal sin is much less grievous than any one of those previously pardoned. Therefore the debt of punishment incurred through subsequent sins is not equal to that of sins previously forgiven. I answer that. Some have maintained that the debt of punishment incurred through ingratitude in respect of a subsequent sin is equal to that of the sins previously pardoned, in addition to the debt proper to the subsequent sin. But there is no need for this, because as stated above in Article 1, the debt of punishment incurred by previous sins does not return on account of a subsequent sin as resulting from the acts of the subsequent sin. Wherefore the amount of the debt that returns must be according to the gravity of the subsequent sin. It is possible, however, for the gravity of the subsequent sin to equal the gravity of all previous sins. But it need not always be so, whether we speak of the gravity which a sin has from its species, since the subsequent sin may be one of simple fornication, while the previous sins were adulteries, murders, or sacrileges, or of the gravity which it incurs through the ingratitude connected with it. For it is not necessary that the measure of ingratitude should be exactly equal to the measure of the favor received, which latter is measured according to the greatness of the sins previously pardoned. Because it may happen that in respect of the same favor, one man is very ungrateful, 
either on account of the intensity of his scorn for the favor received, or on account of the gravity of the offenses committed against the benefactor, while another man is slightly ungrateful, either because his scorn is less intense, or because his offense against the benefactor is less grave. But the measure of ingratitude is proportionately equal to the measure of the favor received. For supposing an equal contempt of the favor, or an equal offense against the benefactor, the ingratitude will be so much the greater as the favor received is greater. Hence it is evident that the debt of punishment incurred by a subsequent sin need not always be equal to that of previous sins, but it must be in proportion thereto, so that the more numerous or the greater the sins previously pardoned, the greater must be the debt of punishment incurred by any subsequent mortal sin whatever. Reply to Objection 1. The favor of the pardon of sins takes its absolute quantity from the quantity of the sins previously pardoned, but the sin of ingratitude does not take its absolute quantity from the measure of this favor bestowed, but from the measure of the contempt or of the offense as stated above, and so the objection does not prove. Reply to Objection 2. A slave who had been given his freedom is not brought back to his previous state of slavery for any kind of ingratitude, but only when this is grave. Reply to Objection 3. He whose forgiven sins return to him on account of subsequent ingratitude incurs the debt for all in so far as the measure of his previous sins is contained proportionately in his subsequent ingratitude, but not absolutely as stated above. Fourth Article whether the ingratitude whereby a subsequent sin causes the return of previous sins is a special sin. Objection 1. It would seem that the ingratitude whereby a subsequent sin causes the return of sins previously forgiven is a special sin, for the giving of thanks belongs to counterpassion, which is a necessary condition of justice, as the philosopher shows in Ethics 5.5. 5. But justice is a special virtue, Therefore, this ingratitude is a special sin. Objection to further. Tully says that thanksgiving is a special virtue, but ingratitude is opposed to thanksgiving. Therefore, ingratitude is a special sin. Objection 3 further. A special effect proceeds from a special cause. Now ingratitude has a special effect, namely the return, after a fashion, of sins already forgiven. Therefore, ingratitude is a special sin. On the contrary, that which is a sequel to every sin is not a special sin. Now by any mortal sin whatever, a man becomes ungrateful to God, as evidenced from what has been said above in Article 1. Therefore, ingratitude is not a special sin. I answer that, the ingratitude of the sinner is sometimes a special sin, and sometimes it is not, but a circumstance arising from all mortal sins in common committed against God. For a sin takes its species according to the sinner's intention, wherefore the philosopher says in Ethics 5.2 that he who commits adultery in order to steal is a thief rather than an adulterer. If, therefore, a sinner commits a sin in contempt of God and of the favor received from him, that sin is drawn to the species of ingratitude, and in this way a sinner's ingratitude is a special sin. If, however, a man, while intending to commit a sin, for example, murder or adultery, is not withheld from it, on account of its implying contempt of God, his ingratitude will not be a special sin, but will be drawn to the species of the other sin as a circumstance thereof. And as Augustine observes in On Nature and Grace 29, not every sin implies contempt of God in his commandments. Therefore it is evident that the sinner's ingratitude is sometimes a special sin, sometimes not. This suffices for the replies to the objections. 
for the first two objections prove that ingratitude is in itself a special sin while the last objection proves that ingratitude as included in every sin is not a special sin end of question 88 read by michael shane craig lambert lc Question 89. Of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 89. Of the Recovery of Virtue by Means of Penance. In Six Articles. We must now consider the recovery of virtues by means of penance, under which head there are six points of inquiry. First, whether virtues are restored through penance. Second, whether they are restored in equal measure. Third, whether equal dignity is restored to the penitent. Fourth, whether works of virtue are deadened by subsequent sin. Fifth, whether works deadened by sin revive through penance. Sixth, whether dead works, that is, works that are done without charity, are quickened by penance. First article, whether the virtues are restored through penance. Objection one. It would seem that the virtues are not restored through penance, because lost virtue cannot be restored by penance, unless penance be the cause of virtue. But since penance is itself a virtue, it cannot be the cause of all the virtues, and all the more, since some virtues naturally precede penance, namely, faith, hope, and charity, as stated above in question 85, article 6. Therefore, the virtues are not restored through penance. Objection to further. Penance consists in certain acts of the penitent. But the gratuitous virtues are not caused through any act of ours. For Augustine says in On the Free Will that God forms the virtues in us without us. Therefore, it seems that the virtues are not restored through penance. Objection 3 further. He that has virtue performs works of virtue with ease and pleasure. Wherefore the philosopher says in Ethics one eight that a man is not just if he does not rejoice in just deeds. Now many penitents find difficulty in performing deeds of virtue. Therefore the virtues are not restored through penance. On the contrary, we read in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15 verse 22 that the father commanded his penitent son to be clothed in the first robe, which, according to Ambrose, is the mantle of wisdom, from which all the virtues flow together. According to Wisdom, chapter 8, verse 7, she teacheth temperance and prudence and justice and fortitude, which are such things as men can have nothing more profitable in life. Therefore, all the virtues are restored through penance. I answer that, sins are pardoned through penance, as stated above in question 86, article 1. But there can be no remission of sins except for the infusion of grace. Wherefore it follows that grace is infused into man through penance. Now all the gratuitous virtues flow from grace, even as all the powers result from the essence of the soul. As stated in the second part, the Pars Prima Secundae, question 110, article 4, first reply. Therefore, all the virtues are restored through penance. Reply to Objection 1. Penance restores the virtues in the same way as it causes grace, as stated above in question 86, article 1. Now, it is a cause of grace, insofar as it is a sacrament, because insofar as it is a virtue, it is rather an effect of grace. Consequently, it does not follow that penance, as a virtue, needs to be the cause of all the other virtues, but
but that the habit of penance together with the habits of the other virtues is caused through the sacrament of penance reply to objection to in the sacrament of penance human acts stand as matter while the formal power of this sacrament is derived from the power of the keys consequently the power of the keys causes grace and virtue effectively indeed but instrumentally and the first act of the penitent namely contrition stands as ultimate disposition to the reception of grace while the subsequent acts of penance proceed from the grace and virtues which are already there reply to objection three as stated above in question eighty six article five sometimes after the first act of penance which is contrition certain remnants of sin remain namely dispositions caused by previous acts the result being that the penitent finds difficulty in doing deeds of virtue nevertheless so far as the inclination itself of charity and of the other virtues is concerned the penitent performs works of virtue with pleasure and ease even as a virtuous man may accidentally find it hard to do an act of virtue on account of sleepiness or some indisposition of the body second article whether after penance man rises again to equal virtue objection one it would seem that after penance man rises again to equal virtue for the apostle says in romans eight verse twenty eight for them that love god all things work together unto good whereupon a gloss of augustine says that this is so true that if any such man goes astray and wanders from the path god makes even this conduce to his good but this would not be true if he rose again to lesser virtue therefore it seems that a penitent never rises again to lesser virtue objection to further ambrose says that penance is a very good thing for it restores every defect to a state of perfection but this would not be true unless virtues were recovered in equal measure therefore equal virtue is always recovered through penance objection three further on genesis one five there was evening and morning one day a gloss says the evening light is that from which we fall the morning light is that to which we rise again now the morning light is greater than the evening light therefore a man rises to greater grace or charity than that which he had before which is confirmed by the apostle's words in romans five verse twenty where sin abounded grace did more abound on the contrary charity whether proficient or perfect is greater than incipient charity but sometimes a man falls from proficient charity and rises again to incipient charity therefore man always rises again to less virtue i answer that as stated above in question eighty six article six third reply and in question eighty nine article one second reply the movement of the free will in the justification of the ungodly is the ultimate disposition to grace so that in the same instant there is infusion of grace together with the aforesaid movement of the free will as stated in the second part in the pars prima secundi question one hundred and thirteen articles five and seven which movement includes an act of penance as stated above in question eighty six article two but it is evident that forms which admit of being more or less become intense or remiss according to the different dispositions of the subject as stated in the second part the pars prima secundi question fifty two articles one and two and question sixty six article one hence it is that in penance according to the degree of intensity or remissness in the movement of the free will the penitent receives greater or lesser grace 
Now the intensity of the penitent's movement may be proportionate, sometimes to a greater grace than that from which man fell by sinning, sometimes to an equal grace, sometimes to a lesser. Wherefore the penitent sometimes arises to a greater grace than that which he had before, sometimes to an equal, sometimes to a lesser grace. And the same applies to the virtues which flow from grace. Reply to Objection 1. The very fact of falling away from the love of God by sin does not work unto the good of all those who love God, which is evident in the case of those who fall and never rise again, or who rise and fall yet again, but only to the good of such as according to his purpose are called to be saints, namely the predestined, who, however often they may fall, yet rise again finally. Consequently, good comes of their falling, not that they always rise again to greater grace, but that they rise to more abiding grace, not indeed on the part of grace itself, because the greater the grace, the more abiding it is, but on the part of man who, the more careful and humble he is, abides the more steadfastly in grace. Hence the same gloss adds that their fall conduces to their good because they rise more humble and more enlightened. Reply to Objection 2 Penance, considered in itself, has the power to bring all defects back to perfection, and even to advance man to a higher state. But this is sometimes hindered on the part of man, whose movement towards God and in detestation of sin is too remiss, just as in baptism adults receive a greater or a lesser grace according to the various ways in which they prepare themselves. Reply to Objection 3. This comparison of the two graces to the evening and morning light is made on account of a likeness of order, since the darkness of night follows after the evening light and the light of day after the light of morning, but not on account of a likeness of greater or lesser quantity. Again, this saying of the Apostle refers to the grace of Christ, which abounds more than any number of man's sins. Nor is it true of all that the more their sins abound, the more abundant grace they receive, if we measure habitual grace by the quantity. Grace is, however, more abundant as regards the very notion of grace, because to him who sins more, a more gratuitous favor is vouchsafed by his pardon. Although sometimes those whose sins abound, abound also in sorrow, so that they receive a more abundant habit of grace and virtue, as was the case with Magdalen. To the argument advanced in the contrary sense, it must be replied that in one and the same man, proficient grace is greater than incipient grace. But this is not necessarily the case in different men, for one begins with a greater grace than another has in the state of proficiency. Thus Gregory says, Let all, both now and hereafter, acknowledge how perfectly the boy Benedict turned to the life of grace from the very beginning. Third article. Whether by penance man is restored to his former dignity. Objection 1. It would seem that man is not restored by penance to his former dignity, because a gloss on Amos chapter 5 verse 2, the virgin of Israel is cast down, observes, it is not said that she cannot rise up, but that the virgin of Israel shall not rise, because the sheep that has once strayed, although the shepherd bring it back on his shoulder, has not the same glory as if it had never strayed. Therefore, man does not, through penance, recover his former dignity. Objection to further. Jerome says, Whoever fail to preserve the dignity of the sacred order must be content with saving their souls, for it is a difficult thing to return to their former degree. Again, Pope Innocent I says that 
the canons framed at the council of nicaea exclude penitents from even the lowest orders of clerics therefore man does not through penance recover his former dignity objection three further before sinning a man can advance to a higher sacred order but this is not permitted to a penitent after his sin for it is written in ezekiel forty four verses ten and thirteen the levites that went away from me shall never come near to me to do the office of priest and as laid down in distinction one chapter fifty two and taken from the council of lerida if those who serve at the holy altar fall suddenly into some deplorable weakness of the flesh and by god's mercy do proper penance let them return to their duties yet so as not to receive further promotion therefore penance does not restore man to his former dignity on the contrary as we read in the same distinction gregory writing to second dinus says we consider that when a man has made proper satisfaction he may return to his honorable position and moreover we read in the acts of the council of agda contumacious clerics so far as their position allows should be corrected by their bishops so that when penance has reformed them they may recover their degree and dignity i answer that by sin man loses a twofold dignity one in respect of god the other in respect of the church in respect of god he again loses a twofold dignity one is his principal dignity whereby he was counted among the children of god and this he recovers by penance which is signified in luke fifteen in the prodigal son for when he repented his father commanded that the first garment should be restored to him together with a ring and shoes the other is his secondary dignity namely innocence of which as we read in the same chapter the elder son boasted saying behold for so many years do i serve thee and i have never transgressed thy commandments and this dignity the penitent cannot recover nevertheless he recovers something greater sometimes because as gregory says those who acknowledge themselves to have strayed away from god make up for their past losses by subsequent gains so that there is more joy in heaven on their account even as in battle the commanding officer thinks more of the soldier who after running away returns and bravely attacks the foe than of one who has never turned his back but has done nothing brave by sin man loses his ecclesiastical dignity because thereby he becomes unworthy of those things which appertain to the exercise of the ecclesiastical dignity thus he is debarred from recovering first because he fails to repent wherefore isidore wrote to the bishop masso as we read in the distinction quoted above in objection three the canons order those to be restored to their former degree who by repentance have made satisfaction for their sins or have made worthy confession of them on the other hand those who do not mend their corrupt and wicked ways are neither allowed to exercise their order nor received to the grace of communion secondly because he does penance negligently wherefore it is written in the same distinction we can be sure that those who show no signs of humble compunction or of earnest prayer who avoid fasting or study would exercise their former duties with great negligence if they were restored to them thirdly if he has committed a sin to which an irregularity is attached wherefore it is said in the same distinction quoting the counsel of pope martin if a man marry a widow or the relict of another he must not be admitted to the ranks of the clergy and if he has succeeded in creeping in he must be turned out in like manner if any one after baptism be guilty of homicide whether by deed or by command or by counsel or in self-defence 
but this is in consequence not of sin but of irregularity fourthly on account of scandal wherefore it is said in the same distinction those who have been publicly convicted or caught in the act of perjury robbery fornication and of such like crimes according to the prescription of the sacred canons must be deprived of the exercise of their respective orders because it is a scandal to god's people that such persons should be placed over them but those who commit such sins occultly and confess them secretly to a priest may be retained in the exercise of their respective orders with the assurance of god's merciful forgiveness provided they be careful to expiate their sins by fasts and alms vigils and holy deeds the same is expressed if the aforesaid crimes are not proved by a judicial process or in some other way made by notorious those who are guilty of them must not be hindered after they have done penance from exercising the orders they have received or from receiving further orders except in cases of homicide reply to objection one the same is to be said of the recovery of virginity as of the recovery of innocence which belongs to man's secondary dignity in the sight of god reply to objection two in these words jerome does not say that it is impossible but that it is difficult for man to recover his former dignity after having sinned because this is allowed to none but those who repent perfectly as stated above to those canonical statutes which seem to forbid this augustine replies in his letter to boniface if the law of the church forbids any one after doing penance for a crime to become a cleric or to return to his clerical duties or to retain them the intention was not to deprive him of the hope of pardon but to preserve the rigor of discipline else we should have to deny the keys given to the church of which it was said whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven and further on he adds for holy david did penance for his deadly crimes and yet he retained his dignity and blessed peter by shedding most bitter tears did indeed repent him of having denied his lord and yet he remained an apostle nevertheless we must not deem the care of later teachers excessive who without endangering a man's salvation exacted more from his humility having in my opinion found by experience that some assumed a pretended repentance through hankering after honours and power reply to objection three this statute is to be understood as applying to those who do public penance for these cannot be promoted to a higher order for peter after his denial was made shepherd of christ's sheep as appears from john twenty one twenty one where chrysostom comments as follows after his denial and repentance peter gives proof of greater confidence in christ for whereas at the supper he durst not ask him but deputed john to ask in his stead afterwards he was placed at the head of his brethren and not only did not depute another to ask for him what concerned him but henceforth asks the master instead of john fourth article whether virtuous deeds done in charity can be deadened objection one it would seem that virtuous deeds done in charity cannot be deadened for that which is cannot be changed but to be deadened is to be changed from life to death since therefore virtuous deeds after being done are no more it seems that they cannot afterwards be deadened objection to further by virtuous deeds done in charity man merits eternal life but to take away the reward from one who has merited it is an injustice which cannot be ascribed to god therefore it is not possible for virtuous deeds done in charity to be deadened by a subsequent sin objection three further 
the strong is not corrupted by the weak now works of charity are stronger than any sins because as it is written in proverbs 10 verse 12 charity covereth all sins therefore it seems that dead deeds done in charity cannot be deadened by a subsequent mortal sin on the contrary it is written in ezekiel 18 verse 24 if the just man turn himself away from his justice all his justices which he hath done shall not be remembered i answer that a living thing by dying ceases to have vital operations for which reason by a kind of metaphor a thing is said to be deadened when it is hindered from producing its proper effect or operation now the effect of virtuous works which are done in charity is to bring man to eternal life and this is hindered by a subsequent mortal sin inasmuch as it takes away grace wherefore deeds done in charity are said to be deadened by a subsequent mortal sin reply to objection one just as sinful deeds pass as to the act but remain as to guilt so deeds done in charity after passing as to the act remain as to merit in so far as they are acceptable to god it is in this respect that they are deadened inasmuch as man is hindered from receiving his reward reply to objection to there is no injustice in withdrawing the reward from him who has deserved it if he has made himself unworthy by his subsequent fault since at times a man justly forfeits through his own fault even that which he has already received reply to objection three it is not on account of the strength of sinful deeds that deeds previously done in charity are deadened but on account of the freedom of the will which can be turned away from good to evil fifth article whether deeds deadened by sin are revived by penance objection one it would seem that deeds deadened by sin are not revived by penance because just as past sins are remitted by subsequent penance so are deeds previously done in charity deadened by subsequent sin but sins remitted by penance do not return as stated above in question eighty eight articles one and two therefore it seems that neither are dead deeds revived by charity objection to further deeds are said to be deadened by comparison with animals who die as stated above in article four but a dead animal cannot be revived therefore neither can dead works be revived by penance objection three further deeds done in charity are deserving of glory according to the quantity of grace or charity but sometimes man arises through penance to lesser grace or charity therefore he does not receive glory according to the merit of his previous works so that it seems that deeds deadened by sin are not revived on the contrary on joel 2 verse 25 i will restore you to the years which the locust hath eaten a gloss says i will not suffer to perish the fruit which you lost when your soul was disturbed but this fruit is the merit of good works which was lost through sin therefore meritorious deeds done before are revived by penance i answer that some have said that meritorious works deadened by subsequent sin are not revived by the ensuing penance because they deemed such works to have passed away so that they could not be revived but that is no reason why they should not be revived because they are conducive to eternal life wherein their life consists not only as actually existing but also after they cease to exist actually and as abiding in the divine acceptance now they abide thus 
so far as they are concerned, even after they have been deadened by sin, because those works, according as they were done, will ever be acceptable to God and give joy to the saints, according to Apocalypse 3, verse 11. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That they fail in their efficacy to bring the man who did them to eternal life is due to the impediment of the supervening sin whereby he has become unworthy of eternal life. But this impediment is removed by penance, inasmuch as sins are taken away thereby. Hence it follows that deeds previously deadened recover, through penance, their efficacy in bringing him who did them to eternal life, and in other words, they are revived. It is therefore evident that deadened works are revived by penance. Reply to Objection 1. The very works themselves of sin are removed by penance, so that, by God's mercy, no further stain or debt of punishment is incurred on their account. On the other hand, works done in charity are not removed by God, since they abide in his acceptance, but they are hindered on the part of the man who does them. Wherefore, if this hindrance on the part of the man who does these works be removed, God on his side fulfills what those works deserved. Reply to Objection 2 Deeds done in charity are not in themselves deadened, as explained above, but only with regard to a supervening impediment on the part of the man who does them. On the other hand, an animal dies in itself through being deprived of the principle of life, so that the comparison fails. Reply to Objection 3 He who, through penance, arises to lesser charity, will receive the essential reward according to the degree of charity in which he is found. Yet he will have greater joy for the works he had done in his former charity than for those which he did in his subsequent charity and this joy belongs to the accidental reward. Sixth Article Whether the effect of subsequent penance is to quicken even dead works. Objection 1. It would seem that the effect of subsequent penance is to quicken even dead works, namely those that were not done in charity for it seems more difficult to bring to life that which has been deadened, since this is never done naturally, than to quicken that which never had life, since certain living things are engendered naturally from things without life. Now deadened works are revived by penance as stated above in Article 5. Much more, therefore, are dead works revived. Objection to further. If the cause be removed, the effect is removed. But the cause of the lack of life in works generically good done without charity was the lack of charity and grace, which lack is removed by penance. Therefore, dead works are quickened by charity. Objection 3 further. Jerome, in commenting on Haggaius 1 6, You have sowed much, says, If at any time you find a sinner among his many evil deeds, doing that which is right. God is not so unjust as to forget the few good deeds on account of his many evil deeds. Now this seems to be the case chiefly when past evil deeds are removed by penance. Therefore it seems that through penance God rewards the former deeds done in the state of sin, which implies that they are quickened. On the contrary, the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, If I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. But this would not be true, if at least by subsequent penance they were quickened. Therefore, penance does not quicken works which before were dead. I answer that, 
a work is said to be dead in two ways first effectively because to wit it is a cause of death in which sense sinful works are said to be dead according to hebrews 9 verse 14 the blood of christ shall cleanse our conscience from dead works these dead works are not quickened but removed by penance according to hebrews 6 verse 1 not laying again the foundation of penance from dead works secondly works are said to be dead privatively because to wit they lack spiritual life which is founded on charity whereby the soul is united to god the result being that it is quickened as the body by the soul in which sense too faith if it lack charity is said to be dead according to james 2 verse 20 faith without works is dead in this way also all works that are generically good are said to be dead if they be done without charity inasmuch as they fail to proceed from the principle of life even as we might call the sound of a harp a dead voice accordingly the difference of life and death in works is in relation to the principle from which they proceed but works cannot proceed a second time from a principle because they are transitory and the same identical deed cannot be resumed therefore it is impossible for dead works to be quickened by penance reply to objection one in the physical order things whether dead or deadened lack the principle of life but works are said to be deadened not in relation to the principle whence they proceeded but in relation to an extrinsic impediment while they are said to be dead in relation to a principle consequently there is no comparison reply to objection to works generically good done without charity are said to be dead on account of the lack of grace and charity as principles now the subsequent penance does not supply that want so as to make them proceed from such a principle hence the argument does not prove reply to objection three god remembers the good deeds a man does when in a state of sin not by rewarding them in eternal life which is due only to living works that is those done from charity but by a temporal reward thus gregory declares that unless that rich man had done some good deed and had received his reward in this world abraham would certainly not have said to him thou didst receive good things in thy lifetime or again this may mean that he will be judged less severely wherefore augustine says we cannot say that it would be better for the schismatic that by denying christ he should suffer none of those things which he suffered by confessing him but we must believe that he will be judged with less severity than if by denying christ he had suffered none of those things thus the words of the apostle if i should deliver my body to be burned and not have charity it profiteth me nothing refer to the obtaining of the kingdom of heaven and do not exclude the possibility of being sentenced with less severity at the last judgment end of question 89 read by michael shane craig lambert lc Question 90 of Summa Theologica Tertia Pars, Treatise on the Sacraments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Question 90 on the parts of penance in general, in four articles. We must now consider the parts of penance. One in general two each one in particular under the first head there are four points of inquiry first whether penance has any parts second of the number of its parts third what kinds of parts are they 
Fourth, of its division into subjective parts. First article. Whether penance should be assigned any parts. Objection 1. It would seem that parts should not be assigned to penance. For it is the divine power that works our salvation most secretly in the sacraments. Now the divine power is one and simple. Therefore, penance, being a sacrament, should have no parts assigned to it. Objection to further. Penance is both a virtue and a sacrament. Now no parts were assigned to it as a virtue, since virtue is a habit which is a simple quality of the mind. In like manner, it seems that parts should not be assigned to penance as a sacrament, because no parts are assigned to baptism and the other sacraments. Therefore, no parts at all should be assigned to penance. Objection 3 further. The matter of penance is sin, as stated above in question 84, article 2. But no parts are assigned to sin. Neither, therefore, should parts be assigned to penance. On the contrary, the parts of a thing are those out of which the whole is composed. Now the perfection of penance is composed of several things, namely, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Therefore, penance has parts. I answer that, the parts of a thing are those into which the whole is divided materially, for the parts of a thing are to the whole what matter is to the form. Wherefore the parts are reckoned as a kind of material cause, and the whole as a kind of formal cause, according to Physics 2. Accordingly, wherever, on the part of matter, we find a kind of plurality, there we shall find a reason for assigning parts. Now it has been stated above, in question 84, articles 2 and 3, that in the sacrament of penance, human actions stand as matter, and so, since several actions are requisite for the perfection of penance, namely, contrition, confession, and satisfaction, as we shall show further on in article 2, it follows that the sacrament of penance has parts. Reply to Objection 1. Every sacrament is something simple by reason of the divine power which operates therein. But the divine power is so great that it can operate both through one and through many, and by reason of these many, parts may be assigned to a particular sacrament. Reply to Objection 2. Parts are not assigned to penance as a virtue, because the human acts of which there are several in penance are related to the habit of virtue, not as its parts, but as its effects. It follows, therefore, that parts are assigned to penance as a sacrament to which the human acts are related as matter. Whereas, in the other sacraments, the matter does not consist of human acts, but of some one external thing, either simple as water or oil, or compound as chrism, and so parts are not assigned to the other sacraments. Reply to Objection 3. Sins are the remote matter of penance, inasmuch to wit as they are the matter or object of the human acts, which are the proper matter of penance as a sacrament. Second article. Whether contrition confession and satisfaction are fittingly assigned as parts of penance. Objection 1. It would seem that contrition, confession, and satisfaction are not fittingly assigned as parts of penance. For contrition is in the heart, and so belongs to interior penance, while confession consists of words, and satisfaction in deeds, so that the latter two belong to interior penance. Now interior penance is not a sacrament, but only exterior penance, which is perceptible by the senses. Therefore these three parts are not fittingly assigned to the sacrament of penance. Objection to further. 
grace is conferred in the sacraments of the new law as stated above in question sixty two articles one and three but no grace is conferred in satisfaction therefore satisfaction is not part of the sacrament objection three further the fruit of a thing is not the same as its part but satisfaction is a fruit of penance according to luke three verse eight bring forth fruits worthy of penance therefore it is not a part of penance objection four further penance is ordained against sin but sin can be completed merely in the thought by consent as stated in the second part in the pars prima secunde question seventy two article seven therefore penance can also therefore confession in word and satisfaction indeed should not be reckoned as parts of penance on the contrary it seems that yet more parts should be assigned to penance for not only is the body assigned as a part of man as being the matter but also the soul which is his form but the aforesaid three being the acts of the penitent stand as matter while the priestly absolution stands as form therefore the priestly absolution should be assigned as a fourth part of penance i answer that a part is twofold essential and quantitative the essential parts are naturally the form and the matter and logically the genus and the difference in this way each sacrament is divided into matter and form as its essential parts hence it was said above in question sixty articles five and six that sacraments consist of things and words but since quantity is on the part of matter quantitative parts are parts of matter and in this way as stated above in article one parts are assigned specially to the sacrament of penance as regards the acts of the penitent which are the matter of this sacrament now it has been said above in question eighty five article three third reply that an offence is atoned otherwise in penance than in vindictive justice because in vindictive justice the atonement is made according to the judge's decision and not according to the discretion of the offender or of the person offended whereas in penance the offence is atoned according to the will of the sinner and the judgment of god against whom the sin was committed because in the latter case we seek not only the restoration of the equality of justice as in vindictive justice but also and still more the reconciliation of friendship which is accomplished by the offender making atonement according to the will of the person offended accordingly the first requisite on the part of the penitent is the will to atone and this is done by contrition the second is that he submit to the judgment of the priest standing in god's place and this is done in confession and the third is that he atone according to the decision of god's minister and this is done in satisfaction and so contrition confession and satisfaction are assigned as parts of penance reply to objection one contrition as to its essence is in the heart and belongs to interior penance yet virtually it belongs to exterior penance inasmuch as it implies the purpose of confessing and making satisfaction reply to objection to satisfaction confers grace in so far as it is in man's purpose and it increases grace according as it is accomplished just as baptism does in adults as stated above in question sixty eight article two and in question sixty nine article eight reply to objection three satisfaction is a part of penance as a sacrament and a fruit of penance as a virtue reply to objection four more things are required for good which proceeds from a cause that is entire than for evil which results from each single defect 
as Dionysius states in On the Divine Names 4. And thus, although sin is completed in the consent of the heart, yet the perfection of penance requires contrition of the heart, together with confession in word and satisfaction in deed. The reply to the fifth objection is clear from what has been stated. Third article. Whether these three are integral parts of penance? Objection 1. It would seem that these three are not integral parts of penance. For as stated above in question 84, article 3, penance is ordained against sin. But sins of thought, word, and deed are the subjective and not integral parts of sin, because sin is predicated of each one of them. Therefore in penance also, contrition in thought, confession in word, and satisfaction in deed are not integral parts. Objection to further. No integral part includes within itself another that is condivided with it. But contrition includes both confession and satisfaction in the purpose of amendment. Therefore they are not integral parts. Objection 3 further. A whole is composed of its integral parts, taken at the same time and equally, just as a line is made up of its parts. But such is not the case here. Therefore, these are not integral parts of penance. On the contrary, integral parts are those by which the perfection of the whole is integrated. But the perfection of penance is integrated by these three. Therefore, they are integral parts of penance. I answer that. Some have said that these three are subjective parts of penance. But this is impossible because the entire power of the whole is present in each subjective part at the same time and equally, just as the entire power of an animal as such is assured to each animal species, all of which species divide the animal genus at the same time and equally, which does not apply to the point in question. Wherefore others have said, that these are potential parts. Yet neither can this be true, since the whole is present, as to the entire essence, in each potential part, just as the entire essence of the soul is present in each of its powers, which does not apply to the case in point. Therefore it follows that these three are integral parts of penance, the nature of which is that the whole is not present in each of the parts, either as to its entire power or as to its entire essence, but that it is present to all of them together at the same time. Reply to Objection 1. Sin, for as much as it is an evil, can be completed in one single point, as stated above in Article 2, Fourth Reply. And so the sin which is completed in thought alone is a special kind of sin. Another species is the sin that is completed in thought and word, and yet a third species is the sin that is completed in thought, word, and deed. And the quasi-integral parts of this last sin are that which is in thought, that which is in word, and that which is in deed. Wherefore these three are the integral parts of penance, which is completed in them. Reply to Objection 2. One integral part can include the whole, though not as to its essence, because the foundation in a way contains virtually the whole building. In this way, contrition includes virtually the whole of penance. Reply to Objection 3. All integral parts have a certain relation of order to one another, but some are only related as to position whether in sequence as the parts of an army, or by contact as the parts of a heap, or by being fitted together as the parts of a house, or by continuation as the parts of a line. While some are related, in addition, as to power, as the parts of an animal, the first of which is the heart, the others in a certain order being dependent on one another. 
and thirdly, some are related in the order of time, as the parts of time and movement. Accordingly, the parts of penance are related to one another in the order of power and time, since they are actions, but not in the order of position, since they do not occupy a place. Fourth Article whether penance is fittingly divided into penance before baptism, penance for mortal sins, and penance for venial sins. Objection 1. It would seem that penance is unfittingly divided into penance before baptism, penance for mortal, and penance for venial sins. For penance is the second plank after shipwreck, as stated above in question 84, article 6 while baptism is the first. Therefore, that which precedes baptism should not be called a species of penance. Objection to further. That which can destroy the greater can destroy the lesser. Now mortal sin is greater than venial, and penance which regards mortal sins regards also venial sins. Therefore, they should not be considered as different species of penance. Objection 3 further. Just as after baptism man commits venial and mortal sins, so does he before baptism. If therefore penance for venial sins is distinct from penance for mortal sins after baptism, in like manner they should be distinguished before baptism. Therefore penance is not fittingly divided into these species. On the contrary, Augustine says in On Penance that these three are species of penance. I answer that this is a division of penance as a virtue. Now it must be observed that every virtue acts in accordance with the time being, as also in keeping with other due circumstances. Wherefore the virtue of penance has its act at this time according to the requirements of the new law. Now it belongs to penance to detest one's past sins, and to purpose, at the same time, to change one's life for the better, which is the end, so to speak, of penance. And since moral matters take their species from the end, as stated in the second part, in the Pars Prima Secundae question 1, article 3, as well as in question 18, articles 4 and 6, it is reasonable to distinguish various species of penance according to the various changes intended by the penitent. Accordingly, there is a threefold change intended by the penitent. The first is by regeneration unto a new life, and this belongs to that penance which precedes baptism. The second is by reforming one's past life after it has already been destroyed and this belongs to penance for mortal sins committed after baptism. The third is by changing to a more perfect operation of life, and this belongs to penance for venial sins, which are remitted through a fervent act of charity as stated above in question 87 articles 2 and 3. Reply to Objection 1. The penance which precedes baptism is not a sacrament, but an act of virtue disposing one to that sacrament. Reply to Objection 2. The penance which washes away mortal sins washes away venial sins also, but the converse does not hold. Wherefore these two species of penance are related to one another as perfect and imperfect. Reply to Objection 3. Before baptism, there are no venial sins without mortal sins. And since a venial sin cannot be remitted without mortal sin, as stated above in question 87, article 4, before baptism, penance for mortal sins is not distinct from penance for venial sins. End of question 90. Read by Michael Shane Craig Lambert, L.C. After a mystical experience on December 6th, 1273, Thomas Aquinas abandoned all further writing, theological and philosophical. End of what Thomas Aquinas had written of the treatise on the sacraments.
End of what Thomas Aquinas completed of the Summa Theologica.